deliver it tonight after there's four prisoners that escaped from the county jail. One of them was a huge murder. Can I read that one on top of that? Alan? We have also learned there were fewer than 10 workers at that jail or 800 inmates. Did you see those signs from Georgia? We turn now to the war in Ukraine. Tonight, Ukraine for the first time using U.S. supplied long range missiles to strike two Russian air bases. Two Ukrainian government sources tonight saying these videos show everyone's airfield after the Ukrainian strikes. Ukraine tonight saying nine Russian helicopters and logistics equipment were all destroyed. The Biden administration approved transfer of those power bills. This is amazing.
I don't know if anyone can hear this, but is there any audio? Hi, everyone. My name is Mark Jimenez. I work for the city of South Pasadena. We're having some technical difficulties right now. Um, most likely, we will reset the Zoom. So if you guys can all just be patient. Sorry for any inconvenience. Okay, great. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Testing, testing. There it is. It's it's lit up. Okay. Thank, thank you so much, Tiara. Tiara. Okay. 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 We can hear you now. Let me call Mark real quick. Check, 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 check. Mic check. Can you? Can you? Awesome. Can you All see? Right. Mic check. Awesome. Okay. Bye bye. Okay. <laughs> Are we good? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Ready? Yes. Right. Okay, sure. great. Thank you. So and I, I, let, I guess let me say for those online, we're going to do a presentation, we'll have commissioner questions, and then we'll have public comment after that and wrap, end it with a discussion. But Ian, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, here we go. So um, I was just saying that um, there's 26,000 people or so that live in the city, and there's 28,000 cars just on a day on Fremont. So we know it's not every man, woman, and child in South Pasadena driving all day up and down its road. So there's a tremendous amount of cut-through traffic coming through here. And, and that's, that's um, creating a negative situation in the city. The, their arterials can't handle it. Um, people can't get out of their driveways. Uh, there's dangerous streets. There's speeding. There's, there's folks whose expectations of speed aren't being met, so they drive aggressively. So um, 
it, it damages your business environment. It damages your quality of life. Um, we heard there's too much through traffic, just plain and simple. Um, and residents are paying the price economically and through their through their safety. I'm going to start with something about culture for a second, because there's a culture here that um, I think we need to understand in order to change the culture so we can position ourselves for um, a better solution. And I want to talk about vocabulary because the words we choose affect the way we think about concepts. Um, and a lot of the vocabulary that my profession, transportation engineering uses, was coined in the kind of the golden age of the car. So a lot of it has embedded subjective values. And if you read the old highway capacity manual, it literally says in the foreword that a group of people got together in Washington, DC and coined the vocabulary that would, would spread and be used throughout the profession. And a lot of the, um, the sort of the ideas that were popular at that time was embedded in our, in our language. You know, you see what I mean as we move forward. And I want to um, talk about the analogous situation during the women's movement in the 1970s. And here's a cartoon. Um, I used to have a cartoon column, so these are from that little column. <laughs> but dear, you can't be a policeman, you're a girl. And as long as we said it was policeman and not police officer, it would, it would create a bias against women being police officers. And there was all kinds of language in the 70s, like fireman, mailman, manpower. Now it's human resources, um, man hours, and chairman. And the women's movement changed the vocabulary to be inclusive. And because of that, now there's women in all these different fields. Um, there, there's women chairs, not chairmans. And, and so it really changed things. And so what they were saying at the time was, if you can change the language, you can change the culture. And if you can change the culture, you can change decisions, policies, and outcomes. And so in transportation uh, engineering, we have our own language. Once your street is improved, the curve will be right here. And so that engineer pointing at the stake in the ground may not be biased himself, but he's using biased language. So the homeowner thinks of him as biased because of the language. So it, it shows that it, that change, which he called an improvement, means that they're widening the road, they're cutting the tree down, and the street will be closer to this person's house, which is not an improvement. So it shows a bias against the homeowner and and for the through traffic that will benefit by the wider road. Um, upgrades, sure, got plenty. Even the street got upgraded to an arterial just the other day. So if you live on that street, it's not an upgrade at all. So it, it, it's from the perspective of the through motorist that it's an upgrade. And how can you argue against an upgrade? Because by definition, it's a better thing, right? Traffic demand is if it's something imperative that we have to accommodate. Um, like um, some people equate it to water and pipes, that it's incompressible fluid has to be accommodated. And that, that's just not true. It's motor vehicle use. And if we think of it as that, then we can alter it. If we think of it as something so imperative that is a demand, then we have to sort of uh, hands off and allow it to happen. And we don't have to. Um, to make this more efficient, she added two more or four more lanes. And the profession picked the word efficient because it, it saves travel time. It really means speeding things up. Efficient really means you know, low use of resources, land, energy. Um, and I would suggest that some of what's going on is probably the most inefficient use of land and energy ever. People are commuting long distances, consuming a ton of energy and land. Um, accidents versus collisions. I'm gonna speed up a little bit here. The capacity of the street as if, um, the only thing it's for is to move cars, but streets have the capacity to nurture businesses, to be great places to grow up, to be recreational facilities, to be social places. They have the capacity to create identity. And all of that has been monopolized by this term capacity, which just means how many cars can cross a line in an hour. So we have to think about streets having much more roles than just moving cars. I told you that six lanes would improve the level of service. We say level of service all the time, and, and maybe it even happens in this room, but we never say for whom. And it's just assumed it's for the unstated automobile user, right? It's not for the, the, um, the bus user or the cyclist or the, the business owner. So streets serve all these folks, but we only talk about level of service for one group. And um, I just want to talk a little bit about the purpose of streets. Now, 
Streets have been around for 10,000 years. Cars have been around for just over 100. So for 9,900 years, streets served all these different purposes and cars hadn't even been invented yet. And it was for commerce and socializing and, um, and travel. It's for communication. It was identity. It's placemaking. It had all these different roles. And, and because of the um, power of the motorist and the, I would call it motor dumb, those folks who advocate for the needs of motorists all the time, um, we emphasized only one of those purposes, and that was travel and movement. We didn't, and we de-emphasized all the other roles. And there's all kinds of other terms I'm not going to go into, but there's lots of them that we use routinely, which has a, a leaning to them, which is very pro-automobile and not necessarily city-friendly. So we kind of back, have to back up and think about what's our real purpose? Is it just to move traffic or to create a great place, a great place to live and work, shop, all that? I want to point out a project um, that we were working on in Trenton, New Jersey. So it was, it was removing Highway 29. If you look at the slide on your screen, you'll see on the top right, or sorry, top left, uh, before the highway was built, there was a big Olmstead Park on the waterfront. Terrific address for the downtown, great views. And um, the, the New Jersey DOT said, well, we need to build a highway here so people from the suburbs can drive in and enjoy the culture and the shopping and everything in downtown. But when the highway went in, um, it really slummed out the area. It, it, created, it took value from the downtown and, and exported it to the suburbs. And the people didn't come in and shop and so forth. It became an escape route to the suburbs. And it, there was this um, value flight out of, of the city. And, that, and we've seen that in lots of places. So in our work to remove that highway, we came up with a, a block structure, addressing the waterfront, slowing things down removing the interchange and um, creating a, a new city again with connected waterfronts and a waterfront park. And it took about two years to meet all the different stakeholders involved in because when you take a highway out of the capital city, it's um, everyone notices. And we were having these public meetings and um, we had a consensus from the Army Corps of Engineers to you name it, who was involved. And then uh, Johnny come lately came to one of the public meetings and he was a, a transportation engineer like I am. And he, um, he hadn't been part of the whole process, so he was a little out of touch. And he said, but what about the delay? And I said, well, what do you mean? He says, well, you're taking out a highway when people are driving 60 or 70 miles an hour through the downtown. And you're going to put in this boulevard and a connected network of streets. And folks are going to be driving 25 miles an hour. That's, that's going to create delay. And I said, oh, no, there won't be any delay. And he goes, you're crazy. It's going to create lots of delay. I said, I said, oh, I said, you mean it's going to change travel time by calling it delay as a, if I call it delay in a public meeting or if a public official or this the New Jersey DOT calls it a delay, that's a negative term implying there's a problem by changing the travel time that needs to be addressed. By calling it a change of travel time, it's actually a positive thing because it's safer for everyone driving. It's safer for pedestrians. It connects. We're designing the speeds to be context appropriate. And calling it delay means there's a problem. Changing travel time is an objective term, which allows everyone to talk about it together. So when we're talking about changing travel time through South Pasadena, it's not a delay. It's designing the streets to have the speeds that are appropriate for Orange Avenue and Fair Oaks, for the businesses, for Mission Street, for Monterey, for all of these streets, the slower speeds are appropriate. So it's not a delay, it's a change in travel time. And that difference is really important from a public acceptability perspective, because delay is inherently a negative term that people want to solve. And we're actually solving for excessive speeds, not travel time for motorists. So that's very, so it's important um, for perceptions and, and values. When we met with all the folks, their values were about quality of life, safety, comfort, value, crossing the street. It wasn't about getting cut through traffic through the city fast. And the ITE journal caught on to this and they had me write this paper about removing the bias from the language of transportation engineers. And so this was published in the journal um, a couple of years ago. And it talks about what I just described. And it also talks about all the new terms that have been coined. And I just listed it. I'm just going to list a few from my own career. Um, so traffic calming was the only cool word that existed when I joined the profession 36 or so years ago. 
But then context sensitive design came along, context sensitive solutions came along, traditional neighborhood design came along, smart growth, you know, integrating transportation and land use together. Road diet was coined on one of our projects in West Palm Beach in, um, was it 1997? Uh, that term didn't exist and it spread all across uh, the country. Safe uh, routes to school, complete streets, coined only in 2005. Um, shared spaces, active transportation, separated bike lanes. Now, the, the message here is that the people who develop these terms, can, we can now all express ourselves um, more thoroughly in a more city-friendly, neighborhood-friendly, business-friendly manner. And we need to create more of these words and popularize them so our values are expressed in policy, in design, actions, and decisions. So that's why I talk about language early, because it's, it's a culture thing. And without that language, it would be really difficult to do our jobs. So why do cities exist? Again, this is fundamental. And I, I want to focus a little bit on why we're suggesting the things we're suggesting for, for your city, um, and not just what they are, because without the background, it's really difficult to assess them. And so we have people back at the studio, at the library, drawn up what we heard. And by Thursday, we'll have them drawn and we can share them. But the, the important thing is to understand why, because then everybody in the room and everybody here can judge them through that lens um, and not through a conventional lens. So the purpose of cities is to advance efficient and, and effective exchange. Cities were invented 10,000 years ago to bring people together for exchange because when they're spread out all over the landscape, it was difficult. So we exchange labor, ideas, education, culture, jobs, um, all these things come together in cities. And the transportation purpose of cities is to shorten trips, to bring them together. And my profession has done its best to speed things up and lengthen trips, which spreads out cities and reduces exchange, which when you think about it is anti-city. Now, they didn't do it to harm cities. They did it because they thought all else would stay equal and people would just be able to get places faster. But it had a huge effect on markets, transportation policy, and you know these unintended consequences of what seemed like a good idea at the time. And so those purposes of streets I was talking about, travel took precedence over everything else. And we're learning from our meetings with the public that everything else matters too. And we've gone too far and there's too much traffic going through the city too quickly. So this is, um, I wanna talk about arterial streets because all three of the streets that we're focusing on are arterial streets. Now this is an arterial street in Richmond, Virginia. It's called Broad Street and it's the biggest arterial historically in the city. And on that street, you can see department stores, there's civic buildings, there's residences, there's theaters, and there's transit. Transit is on is accessible on arterials mostly. You don't see transit mostly on local streets. It's on arterials. So the, you see all those people with all that social and economic exchange going on. So the main arterial was the busiest, most vibrant street in terms of social and economic exchange in the whole city. And when you look at a map of Richmond, the black lines represent the trolley routes. And those trolley routes concentrate on that very thick line in the middle, and that's Broad Street. So the entire city was a transit-oriented development, and all the shops and so forth lined those trolley routes, and um, eventually got you to, to the, the biggest arterial, which had the most social and economic exchange on it. The, the white bars next to those black lines are the three-minute walk contours. South Pasadena, LA, um, Detroit, Pittsburgh, all these street, all these places were transit-oriented developments because that's how cities evolved. And after World War II, starting in like 1948, 49, we started dismantling all of that for a new and untested model about cars and level service focused transportation engineering. An untested model, I may add, didn't have the benefit of 10,000 years of evolution. And, and the, um, the unintended consequences happened. And so we're thinking today that that model isn't working for cities. We've had 75 years of trial and error with that model in the LA region. And you think with 75 years of trying this, with all the billions of dollars of spending on highways and so forth, that this would be the most uncongested place on earth. But it's the opposite. When you hear about LA, they talk about the traffic. You talk about highways, they talk about LA. The model has not worked. 
and it's not working for your city right now. So our thesis here is we need to start changing the paradigm, changing the model to something that has worked and has worked around the world and in the United States today. So this is the role of arterials um, before the car was invented up until the trolleys were removed. Arterials were about access, the huge access. You saw it yourself with the Broad Street picture. It had a throughput role as well, but accessing transit, jobs, department stores, theaters, um, and you saw all the people there accessing things on the arterial street. And so this, this conforms to what we call traditional values that date way back. Um, networks, social connectedness, proximity, the things that made cities great. And until 1949, you see this picture here, this is where they decided to embrace the modern ideas of transportation, the untested ones. And in 1949, they started dismantling all of their trolley lines and all of their short walking trips. And that's the same view today as it was um, in the first picture. So they've ironed out all of their social and economic exchange. Their businesses are suffering. There's social issues up and down the street. It's no longer a place, it's a conduit. There's more traffic on the street today, but less trips. And we'll go into that in more detail. So the, the humans, these are the two famous Leonardo da Vinci drawings. The one on the left is when he, when he was writing about the human being being the common denominator for all design. And then it switched, the profession switched it to the motor vehicle. And that's where the wheels kind of fell off city making. So that's that little map I showed you of Richmond and that's, that's Richmond today. And so they sprawled out in an automobile dependent pattern. Transit's no longer effective. Uh, people are car dependent and that that model, which survived for 10,000 years until the, the profession changed it, um, turned to this model. And you'll see this in every transportation textbook where the theory is that arterials are about throughput, local streets are about access, and collectors are somewhere in between. So this shaped policy, it shaped design, it shaped funding decisions, and, and made our arterials about throughput and not about access. And we see the repercussions today here in real time. And it's not, it's not pretty, it's killing people, it's dangerous, it's, it's, people can't even get out of their own driveways. So this model, which was untested when it was brought in and became fashionable, failed our cities, failed our arterials, failed our businesses. So this is Richmond, the newer part, and you can see in the aerial photograph, there's darker areas and lighter areas. The lighter areas are along the arterials. And I'm, I'm excluding the downtown or special districts like office parks. And you can see by the um, lightness that that's where you'll find the grocery stores, you'll find the shops, the businesses. The market still wants access on the arterials, just like it has historically, even in the newer parts of Richmond. Same in Buffalo. You can see where the arterials are because that's where the economy is. Outside of downtown, that's where the economy is on the arterials. That's where the transit is. Portland, same pattern. Detroit, same pattern. Hartford, doesn't matter where you go. Atlanta, Olympia, Washington. So even in new places that are built, the arterials want access. But the profession, the, the transportation folks want throughput and do access management to, to deny the historic role of arterials for the benefit of longer trips, faster trips, um, so I would suggest this is the correct model for your city. Your city grew up in a traditional era. You have a beautiful street network. You have buildings up to the street on your arterials. The DNA of this city speaks to that diagram, not the modern one. I'll use um, Chattanooga as an example. So this is the arterial road that goes along the waterfront in Chattanooga. And Chattanooga wanted to be have a nice downtown. And they built this big aquarium. You can see the roof poking out over the trees on the left. And it didn't work. Um, they thought, build a cool building, people will come, and it will revitalize the downtown. It didn't work because they, it was fundamentally not walkable. They didn't have access to their own waterfront because of that big arterial. And we drew this picture of a two-lane street with steps down to the water to make it accessible, slower, beautiful, make it into a place. And oh my gosh, the Tennessee DOT didn't say no to our idea. They said, hell no. Um, and they, they believed in the, what we call the conventional paradigm, 
They said the lifeblood of the city is that highway. You know, it, it, we have to battle congestion. And they, they said it should be expanded even. Uh, removing it is anti-progress. That's what they argued. The city, who aligned with traditional values, said, no, walkability, context, and these sorts of things are important, and we need to remove it uh, because it's fundamental to access to the waterfront. So that's the before picture. You can see the aquarium on the right. So watch closely. That's the before picture. That's what it looks like today. So before and after. So now it's a two-lane street. It was a huge battle with the Tennessee DOT, um, but luckily the city prevailed. And now it's a fantastic place. And if you ask anybody in that area if they would like their arterial back, um, they would say no. Um, there's more jobs, there's more cool things going on at that town than there ever was when it was car dependent. So let's get to the arterials here. Our, we're look, those, those black lines are almost proportional to the traffic volumes. So we're looking at the three busiest arterials in town. And they're carrying way more traffic than they ought to. Um, and it's through traffic. Here's a picture of an aerial. Um, South Pasadena is kind of the top left. Same pattern. The market wants our access on the arterials. You know, the businesses along Fair Oaks want people to be able to stop. They want people to cross the street. They want people in the neighborhoods to be able to cross to their bus or to their school. So access to all these things are really important. So what I, I would suggest that we start to distance ourselves from this obsolete modern model that was untested and hasn't worked and go with something that has worked and has the propensity to work. And this is a drawing we did last time we were here. And it just shows that there's locations around South Pasadena, which will, will always supply as many cars as we provide for. We could make Fair Oaks 10 lanes wide and it would fill up. We know it will. Um, and to cut through right now is rational in the self-interest of the people doing it. So we can't build our way out of congestion. We can't keep making it easier to drive through and expect people not to fill up that car carrying capacity. This little cartoon I did about, um, so South Pasadena, I choose to exercise my freedom to drive in the suburbs. Now I want to drive fast through here without delay. And so I demand that public taxes be spent to widen your roads, lower your safety, health, and quality of life. Fair deal, I want to shake on it. So this is the, and I could sense it from the anger from the community at these meetings, that the expectation of these drivers is that we need to submit to their needs to drive through. And we need to adjust our lifestyles to accommodate it. They just assume that, that, that their trip through the city is more important than your life on the street and your kid's life walking to school and that kind of thing. So the vision, vision to us means a consensus on what the place ought to be like, not what it is like, but what it should be like ideally. And, and that's what we were hearing from the folks. We asked them four questions. Um, what you like about the place you want to preserve, what you don't like, what you want to change. Um, uh, what's missing that you would want to create? And what are the values that you want to impart here so that in 20 years, 25 years, you look back and you write to your, your grandchildren um, what it was like and what it's become. And, and, and those values are expressed in your public realm. So there's the city and our focus coming in were these three arterials. But then we heard about parallel routes that are, because these are three arterials are now failing to carry all the loads. And so there's then this transfer effect over these others. And then there's little streets um, that are being affected. And there's probably missing ones on here. But the if we want to solve this, it, it's not about um, we don't have enough lanes. It's we have too much traffic. And so we need to reduce the traffic, not just on the three main roads, but on all of these streets. And we have to change the behaviors. And the the strategy that works, not just in North America, but elsewhere, is we, we need to cap the car carrying capacity at some sort of policy level of what's appropriate through the city and create a consistent car carrying capacity and slow things down. That is the bottom line kind of recipe for the, the cities around the world who have succeeded in the sort of car-oriented environment we live in. And so what we're suggesting is not just these three main streets, but all of these routes, we need to slow down and figure out what's an appropriate level of traffic and then design for that. And then we'll end up with safe, comfortable streets that you can get out of your driveway, the fire department can get around, 
um, people can get to businesses and we'll create an environment where people want to invest and shop and, and be. We want, we want to go from a hard environment that is uncomfortable to a softer environment that well, people want to spend time here and walk here and, and sit at cafes here um, and live here. And part of that is the complete streets idea. And so this is a, a little cartoon about that. The, the mobile uses the blue and green groups. Um, it's, it's pretty easy to accommodate the buses, trucks, and so forth. It's more difficult to accommodate the sensitive users, uh, people rolling or biking or walking or kids. So we need to design those streets for all of those users to comfortably use it. And the key is comfortable, not technically we've got a sidewalk, but it's actually comfortable to use the sidewalk and cross the street. And increasingly complete streets is about supporting what's on the sides of the streets, the institutions, the homes, the recreational areas, the, you know, the, um, the businesses. And so that's the place function. So what we're focused on in our designs that you'll see as we, we draw them this week is designing your streets to support the vulnerable users of your, of your public realm, not just the traffic. And that's so important for the value of your city, the image of your city, your business success, your tax base, um, and your safety. So these are the sorts of things we heard. We want safety, less traffic, reduced speeds. We want economic vibrancy. We want our businesses to be successful, our housing to be comfortable. And we want quality of life. I, I put in this script because what we're suggesting is unconventional. And I want you to be more comfortable with that moving forward. Uh, Simon Rushdie in 1996 did a convocation speech. And I have a habit of listening to convocation speeches because people put a lot of thought into those speeches. And they, they try and motivate. They try and help the students, the graduates, position themselves with some words of wisdom for their futures. And he said the people that make a difference in the world are those who are able to defy convention. And um, he calls it defying the gods. And he didn't mean the religious gods, but the, the corporate gods, in our case, the transportation gods, the planning gods, the, the things that you're supposed to just accept and, and keep, keep going, not challenge. So he gave some examples. Um, you know, Nicholas Copernicus challenged the idea that the earth was in the solar, center of the solar system. He said, his, his math said that the sun was in the middle of the solar system. And, and when you change the model, the fundamental assumption of the model, then everything made sense. It was so hard to predict the planets when the Earth was in the middle. It was always error. As soon as the sun was in the middle, they could perfectly uh, predict the orbits of the planets. Um, Jaeger, uh, 1947, broke the sound barrier. The best physicists in the world said, you know, just a couple of years before that, that is impossible. It is, you can't do it. And early in my career, when I was the head of transportation um, for the city of West Palm Beach, I was told I couldn't narrow lanes on arterial streets. And you couldn't believe, you know, we didn't have any of that terminology to describe what we wanted to do, but we did it. We coined the language to describe it. We went to Congress to allow federal money to be used to remove car carrying capacity from, from state arterials. Um, none of that was allowed um, when we started. Uh, you know, modern painting, uh, Picasso drew the, painted those beautiful life-like paintings in his teens, and then he painted modern painting. And so um, Rushdie's point was, if you want to be, if you want to challenge convention, you have to understand it first. And so when Picasso drew those modern art, he drew exactly what he wanted. That wasn't an arbitrary monkey splattering paint on a canvas. He wanted to do that. So we, we've got some very clever people on, on staff at your city and we have some very clever people on our team and we're we're defying convention because we've studied it we understand its flaws and we think we've studied cities that are successful and have a, a course of action that could actually work and one of the really interesting things was um just before world war ii the, the modernists popularized this idea that value was not a function of proximity which was a a given for 10,000 years, that's what people believed in cities. The closer to the core, the more valuable. They said, no, that's wrong. Value is a function of travel time. And if you could speed things up, you can spread out the value. And that assumption, though it wrong, people believed it. And it shaped our, our metrics. It shaped our policies, our funding. Um, it was all about speeding things up. Even our models are all about travel time. Our whole thinking is about reducing travel time. And so um, here are some of the cool things that are helping cities. Um, in 1972, Carmen Hausklau in Germany coined the uh, term traffic calming. 
Um, Hans Monnen brought in shared space in, in the 80s. The Road Diet was started in 1997 by Dan Burden. And Complete Streets, Barbara McCann brought that in 2005. And those people um, went against the grain, but changed the profession and changed cities. And that's, that's what we're talking about. So there's all sorts of room for innovation still from all, all just the things I listed, from the metrics to the modeling, the way we model things, the way we think about it. So, so convention is um, the way you do things that it's accepted and you're supposed to conform. Um, and I'm just gonna use fashion. So this is the Oscars. And so there's a lot of people who's, who dress conventionally, the men in tuxes and the women in beautiful gowns. But there's these unconventional people that show up once in a while and they defy convention. And, and some people get very uncomfortable with it because they think it's disrespectful or wrong or you're going against the grain. Um, and maybe they did, but, but they're, they evoke conversation. They challenge things. And then there's the, the long-standing traditional look. You can't go wrong with James Bond's tux or those women's gowns. Like you, can't, you just can't go wrong with that. So in transportation, there's the convention, you know, building interchanges and, and trying to keep them working, um, widening streets like that big arterial. And then there's the, the unconventional, like the Milwaukee highway teardown, which is in that photograph up there, or the shared space um, in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts on the right. And then there's what you, you just can't go wrong with is a traditional network on the bottom left um, and the classic Main Street. And you have the fantastic street network here and you could have a classic Main Street on Mission, but right now it's a truck route with too many lanes. You know, it's, but it's ready for becoming cool. This is a, what we call the, the universal equation for land use and transportation planning. And this equation is, or something like it, is what is helping shaping the best cities in the world. Oslo, Copenhagen, Paris, um, increasingly places like um, Denver, and Minneapolis, and Seattle, and hopefully right here. And there's, there's four parts to it. So you, we want to reduce vehicle miles traveled, and that's a stated goal of the state of California. And we do that by reducing the percentage of trips by car. We do it um, by reducing the trip length, but we also want the economy to go up. So how this works is we want the vehicle miles traveled to go up, but we want the total number of trips to go up. And trips is transportation speak for the economy. We want more social trips, economic trips, um, education trips, tourist trips, shopping trips, work trips. But if that's gonna go up and vehicle miles are gonna go down, we need the modal split to change even more and the length of trip. This is the DNA of any solution to, to make a better uh, city. And then I just listed a whole bunch of ways you can do that. That's just a sample and you can see it on your screen from, um, from a modal split, from adding sidewalks, um, from changing trip lengths to getting your, your network more connected and two-way and one-way streets and, and slowing your streets down. So what I'd suggest is any change that's suggested in your city, whether it's a land use change or transportation change, think of this as a litmus test. Does it support those trajectories? And if it does, your city's going to get better. If it doesn't, your city's not going to get better. So this is something that you can use to help make decisions on very, very thorny and emotional issues. Um, and that's how the best cities do it. And I'll just use this little um, kind of cartoon to illustrate the point that traffic volume and trips are different ideas. And it's important to think about that. Um, and I'll just use this little cartoon to, just to show why that's important. So we're gonna talk about average tripling. So here's a, an orange street and a pink street. And those bars in those street re represent the length of trips. And you can see the lengths of the trips on the, the left on the orange are much shorter than the very long trips on the right. So I, I measured them and averaged them. So the average trip length on the orange street is one mile. The average trip length on the pink street is four miles. Now, so there's four times more trip making, four times more economy going on on the orange street. Now, if you put a couple of counters across the street, there's three trips on each street. It crosses three lines. Same traffic volume, 
four times the trips on the orange line because of the shorter trip length. And trip lengths you can change through land use planning and, and all those other things I listed. So that's what we keep forgetting in our transportation profession is the integration of not just transportation tools, but land use tools to help shorten our trip lengths. So this is a, more of a real network situation. Here's two streets. We, we put a tube across the street and there's 18,000 cars a day on the street. So that's the volume. We also did a um, trip length study. The average trip length on the orange street is two miles. The average length on the pink street is six. So there's three times more trips happening on the orange street, three times more shopping, education trips, tourist trips, and so on. Much more vibrant, same infrastructure, same traffic volume, three times the value to the city, more vibrancy. Now, let's say you decide to reward, that you say, oh my God, that, that pink street's so busy. We need to do things to, to help access manage it and keep it flowing. So we stopped left turn lanes, we sped it up. Um, and, and lo and behold, uh, the traffic went up to 20,000 cars a day. On the other street, we decided to calm it. We started, we're gonna add parking on the street. We're going to put bulb outs and trees and all sorts of other things. And the, the volume went down to 15,000. Now, just looking at the volume, you say, ah, 20,000. Okay, that's, that's a more important street. Now, if you, have, if you measure the average trip length, because of the changes on the left, the average trip length went shorter. And the average trip length, because you rewarded the long trip, went longer on the pink street. And so now you have six times more activity on the orange street and less volume. So you can have more trips and less volume in the best cities. And so when you look at your favorite cities, you go on vacation, there's all kinds of trip making going on, probably way more trips than are happening on a lot of the streets here, but way less traffic. And that's what people are clamoring for, less traffic, more vibrancy. And, and this appeals to the engineers in the room, more efficiency, more efficiency in terms of land and fuel, exposure, um, pollution, all that stuff. I'll just give a little personal story of West Palm Beach. Um, I became the head of transportation there in 1996. And when I got there, my predecessors had, had sped up the streets, widened them as far as they could widen, maximizing throughput signal, you know, synchronizing all the signals for great progression, all that kind of stuff. And um, anybody who could had left the city, they moved away. And we took our value out of our downtown, which used to be nice, and exported it to other cities, other places further away, just like it's happening here. People find a cheaper house farther away, they get a bigger house and they cut through here, lowering our quality of life. And that's happened in West Palm Beach. So much so that we became car dependent and we tore down about half our buildings in our downtown to make room for surface parking lots. <laughs> our city hit rock bottom. Um, just before I got there, we had $7,000 in reserves as a city. Um, HBO did a documentary on drug abuse in the United States. It got a, a nominee for Academy Award. It was filmed in our downtown because we had all the gangs, we had all the prostitution, we had, we had all that stuff right in one spot. And this is where they moved to. Nice places further away um, where they get their single family homes. And this is what happened. Uh, the suburbs started bombing us with their cars and, and we, we bent over backwards to accommodate them. And this is what happened. Our, our businesses declined. Um, some of our buildings got boarded up. Um, some of our, our, our more challenged places, we ended up tearing down a lot of the buildings for code and because they burnt. And what we ended up doing was we had a big charrette and we we envisioned the way the city ought to be. And we, we had this big, beautiful plan about how all these buildings should be. And my job was to align the streets to share that vision. Everyone had this fantastic vision of high quality of life, but it couldn't come true unless the public realm supported that sort of land use outcome. And this is what happened. Um, the city developed on traditional values, just like South Pasadena did. And then we adopted this conventional idea and um, we sped things up in the, in the mistaken idea that the value is a function of travel time and we devalued our city. And so this is Dixie Highway, it goes the whole length of the United States in the north-south direction. And this is a Sunday morning. I'm out there trying to figure out how am I gonna change this? And keep in mind, road diet didn't exist at the time. Uh, context sensor design didn't exist. We did not have the vocabulary, but I just felt there was too much space dedicated to motorists through our city and through these businesses. I just want to point out in that building, if you look at the very top of that white building on the left, that those, will, those windows got broken. That building had been vacant for a long time and enough flies had died and fell on the floor to create soil 
so small trees could grow out of that window. I just thought that was kind of interesting. Anyway, um, so I decided that just too much land was dedicated to the motorist. And I thought, okay, we're going to widen the sidewalks and put trees in. And, and that's what we did. And unbelievable objections to this. I raised the intersections so they're all flush with the sidewalk. And every engineer came out of the woodwork and said, you can't do raised intersections and arterials. And we'd raised every one of them through the downtown. And um, they've been in place for over 25 years. And it's been a huge success. People started walking, noticed the windows got repaired. Um, and people started living and working in our downtown again. This is Olive Avenue. This is the street where the return road diet was coined on. Five lane state arterial cutting through our city. Um, big division on the left, property values are higher because it's closer to the water um, than on the right. That's the after picture. We narrowed it to two lanes. This is where we went to Congress to get the money from the federal government for the first time, which opened the doors for every other city in the country. Uh, two elementary schools on the street. Kids can now walk to school. There's two shared use paths on each side. Um, completely changed uh, the, the community. This is North 60 Highway. We painted it down because like Orange and other key streets, we didn't have the money to re replace them all physically um, the way we wanted to. So this one we painted down temporarily with bike lanes and parking. And um, then we had a sewer project come along. And watch closely, that's the before picture, that's the after picture. We built a linear park down one side and a two lane street with lateral shifts on the other side. Again, completely changed the neighborhood. Uh, that's our main street. We one weighed it for throughput purposes. We two weighed it and went from 80% vacant to 100% full. So th this is the pattern. Um, this is a, a vacant building where you know homeless people camped out, and um, we gave this these folks a facade grant. And now there's a waiting list to get in there. And and this is where a lot of the prostitutes used to hang out. Now they can have a nice lunch at the restaurant that's at the bottom of the building. Um, and then density moved in, um, people moved in. And um, interesting thing is that the county who have this fantastic model, this traffic demand forecast model, said, we modeled all your land uses in your vision. And our model proves that if you build those land uses, you're gonna have catastrophic congestion. And then they modeled my street changes with narrowing all the arterials. And they said, just that alone would create catastrophic congestion. And if you put them together, we modeled that too. And it created what they called Biblical congestion. I've never heard of that. Biblical. Um, so they they fought us tooth and nail. So we we actually built those buildings. We narrowed the streets. Nothing happened. Our city got better every single time, just like Copenhagen, just like Oslo, just like San Francisco. So that's the before picture where where this most of the Crack America film was made. And that's the after picture. You know, it just changed dramatically. That's, um, that's a before picture of an abandoned church and we changed it into a little performing arts center and then it, it became a really great place where nobody would tread before because it was so dangerous. And so, so this is a little cartoon I drew about modeling. Um, agreed, removing it helps the businesses, health, identity, safety, pedestrian, cyclists, transit use, equity, land use, but that, and he points to the traffic demand forecast model, um, proves that the highway um, is needed um, to provide an acceptable level of service for motorists during the weekday PM peak hour. We empathize, but there's no choice. So sometimes we look at the models as a oracle. It, it tells the only truth, but it's only one version of the future. And the challenge we gave the county and the state of Florida um, was, is your future based on your judgment? And what happens in real cities, like other models that you can follow, or a traffic demand forecast model. So we said, no, there's different models. We're going to choose a real city instead of a traffic demand forecast model. I just skipped that part. So what I'm encouraging everyone to do is 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 to follow what you see in real places that that have already done it, that that took it on the chin, and and defied the gods and succeeded instead of following the same model that has failed you for 75 years. So this is Copenhagen before, and this is in the early 70s, on um, the before where it was completely car dependent, parking all over, throughput was key. They were doing everything we were doing at that time and they ran out of money and decided, okay, we have too much traffic. And they started doing what's called traffic reduction. And 
and created a strategy using that equation I showed you. And that's the same views on the right today. So it's, it's not just possible, it's been done. There's models out there. There's San Francisco when the Embarcadero Highway went right past the market building. And now it's a fantastic place. More trips happening today. They had 120,000 car trips on that highway. There's more trip making happening. It's just not long distance car trips. It's actually contributing walking trips, bike trips, car trips, transit trips, all the different types of trips. It's a different model. It's a different way of thinking. And that's what we're, we're proposing. This is Milwaukee. And you look at the waterfront, the highest and best use were parking lots uh, when that highway was there. And now it's, you know, people live there. This is in Seoul, Korea. The mayor of Seoul simply removed that highway over the river and restored the river. They did do nothing to add car capacity to the parallel routes and the whole city got better. Everyone thought there's gonna be transfer effects where it'd go, it, it just evaporated as part of, part of their traffic reduction. Now it's the second biggest tourist attraction in all of Korea. This is Paris. Uh, they took the highway off the Seine River. Uh, the, the equivalent of the AAA said, just think of the catastrophic congestion. Traffic's like water and pipes. It's going to go to the other streets. And of course it didn't. The city got better. They're now about to remove 6,000 parking spaces from the downtown. And the city will get better again. Um, I'm not advocating you do that here now. You, you start with logical steps. Every context is different. But you, you, you want to follow that equation uh, in a way that makes sense for here. So we want to follow this traditional paradigm where the higher calling is the community vision. The focus is about short trips. The problem definition is more about making places. The strategies are shorter trips and so forth. The capacity of streets is nurturing businesses and creating character. And, and the outcomes are all positive. You look on the bottom. And what got in the way was the modernists. Um, very compelling uh, personalities like Cabousier. And, and they really preyed on people's... Um, um, personal feelings. So th they would ask you, would you like to get to work faster rather than slower? And they go, yeah, faster. Would you, would you want to get your kids to school faster rather than slower? Yeah, of course, faster. So it's rational in your self-interest to want to go places faster rather than slower. So isn't it rational to have everybody to be able to get places faster rather than slower? So shouldn't we just speed up the arterials and the streets and the city so everyone can go faster rather than slower? And the cities that did that the most now have the most problems, they have the most sprawl, they have the most car dependency. And the key to understanding this pattern is what's called the tragedy of the commons. And um, I don't know if you remember from economics about ancient times where all the shepherds had their own private grazing grounds, but there was a common grazing ground. And it was rational in their self-interest to have their sheep graze on the common grazing ground because it would save their own fields for later. And if they all did it, they would destroy the common grazing ground and it became known as the tragedy of the commons. And so when, when something that's rational in your self-interest, when it's scaled up to society and it does harm, that is the definition of bad public policy. When it's scaled up and it helps, that's good public policy. And so in translation planning, we took something that's rational in our self-interest to be able to drive places faster. We scaled it up and it did tremendous harm, but we did never recognize it was bad public policy. And if you look at the Houstons, the Phoenixes and so forth, they tend to be the worst cities. And the cities that didn't do that tend to be the better cities. The, the pattern's out there, it's clear. So that's the tragedy of the commons. Um, and it happens with, like if everybody with a boat could just catch as many fish, we'd have no fish in the ocean. So same thing, we have to manage the public resource. Uh, I think this is our last example. South Bend, Indiana, beautiful city after World War II. They made um, Studebaker cars, they, um, they had, several trips by train every day to Chicago. And they did the same thing as West Palm Beach and here and all those places. They just rewarded the long trip, the fast trip, and um, exported all the value out of their, their, their city or a lot of the value of the city. They follow that same model that so many cities are following. And that's their main street. <laughs> Look how wide it is. It's one way too. But they did synchronize the signal. So you never have to stop when you're driving through their main street, which is pretty sad actually. And um, we had lots of meetings there and they, they decided to change their paradigm. And there's the map um, and there's their downtown. And so we restored two-way operations on all of their streets. We narrowed them, we made them complete streets. And before the ribbon was cut on the first section, hundreds of millions of dollars investment came into the city. People started coming back, pride started coming back to the city. And the Renaissance of South Bend became a national news story. And the mayor there was a young guy named Pete Buttigieg. You might recognize that guy's name. 
had, had launched his whole career into politics at the federal level. And now he's the head of the US DOT. And he learned through our project to do his Smart Streets Initiative, where what we're talking about today, we talked about there. We were told we were crazy by the, the local engineering group. Um, the mayor was a super smart guy. He saw the patterns around the world and he, he saw where, what was rhetoric and what was um, true. And that was the street along their waterfront. It had been improved such that you could drive along the waterfront super fast and never really have to stop. This is what it looked like when we got there. You know, the oversized lights, four lanes. No people though, nobody wanted to be there. It was unwalkable, uncrossable. And that's what it's like today. And um, well, a couple of years ago, and you can see the investment with the, the um, hotel being built. So now people wanna be there. And that's what we want in Fair Oaks. That's what we want in Fremont. That's what we want on all the streets in South Pasadena. Softening the place from a hard place to a soft place where people are comfortable. And now they're starting to talk about the other side of the river. So this is their um, highway interchange. So we're removing it, um, recycling the, the spaces into a connected network and developing housing, um, better access to the school, walkable separated bike facilities, a waterfront park and all kinds of really people oriented things. You know, much better network. And so that street, this is the first phase, which would hopefully start soon. That horrible street, which used to have be a little retail street historically before the interchange, will become a beautiful little main street with um, two lanes, no turn lanes on this street, um, trees, separated bike facilities. So they have adopted the traditional paradigm in South Bend, um, and, it's, and it's working very well, just like West Palm Beach, uh, just like a bunch of other cities we've worked at. They're following that equation. Um, I just want to talk, when a typical person in the community, and they asked us this last time we were here, where's the traffic going to go? Like, they, they think it's impossible. Like, pe people are driving their cars. It, it has to be accommodated. It's like, they, they believe it. And these are the obvious places it goes. They change route. They change into the shoulders of the peaks. They chain their trip together, or they change mode. That's what everyone thinks happens. But there's four more things that they, they start to make shorter route changes. They, they, people move, they move their jobs, they move their houses over time. And, and over time, they become closer together. And they substitute trips. Like instead of going to a university class, you can get online and go to it. So you don't make the trip. Or you, you don't behave like me, where I do a, like a project, a home project, and I, go, I take four trips to Home Depot. <laughs> like if I plan better, I could make it in one trip or two trips, you know, just trip it would just reduce those useless trips. So that's what people think happens. And that, that universal equation I showed you, that's what planners and engineers do um, so that we're all pulling in the same direction. So we make it easy for people to do this. So this is how people behave. That universal equation is how professionals position the city to make this happen. And that's how Copenhagen succeeded. And that's how um, San Francisco succeeded. Man, this is a long presentation. Uh, mobility. Yeah, I want to make sure we get to questions and okay. discussion too. So I don't know how like much that. is left. I think this is getting pretty close to the end. I see why you keep a backup PowerPoint clicker. Oh, yeah, for the yeah. batteries. <laughs> so let's go through mobility quickly because people will say, well, what about mobility? And when I got out of school, this is what everyone thought mobility meant. The easy movement of people and goods. And you'll probably hear that is maybe even in your comp plan. Who knows? And the idea is that further and faster is better. And easy movement of people and goods makes sense in a rural environment, but easy movement in a city violates the reason cities exist. They exist to reward short trips and transit trips. So it's context insensitive to the built environment because of that tragedy of the common. I would recommend, especially this committee, think about this definition of mobility for, for your city. It's the population's capabilities to, and strategies to move in order to access people need to live and thrive within the city. And populations is S apostrophe. There's all kinds of people who have mobility needs in your city. I just listed them up there. I won't go through them. And they're not being met today. We're only trying to meet motor vehicle mobility, but not for cyclists and transit users and other folks. So we need a way different set of priorities um, for the populations we're serving. We move to access things. We don't move for the purpose of moving. There's a reason we're moving, and it's for these things. 20% of our trip is to get to work. 
80% of our trip making has to do with other trips. And we obsess about that work trip. And now that's getting less because of the um, working from home thing because of the pandemic. So it's less than 20% now. Now, if we can mix those land uses properly, we can shorten trips dramatically. And if we can provide what people need in South Pasadena, closer you know, from food to education to whatever people need, um, we'll have shorter trips. Here's a little cartoon I did about this. Hello, mixed land use and density reduce my average weekend trip length by about 85%. So this guy gets it. Everything he needs was in three feet of him um, on the weekend. And so his mobility is increased and he hardly has to move at all. And so that's the kind of thinking we need in cities. And if you think about access and populations together, that talks about equity. And there's so many talks about equity, about meeting the needs of all the populations. If you think about these together, it's about efficient and effective exchange, which aligns completely with the purpose of cities. So this makes sense when you, when you go through the whole cycle of thinking about city making. The other mobility definition doesn't. It's anti-city. And it's been harming cities ever since it was popularized by the modernists after World War II. So I would, I would adopt the traditional paradigm. And then for the big, this is the last slide, I think, the big ideas that we have that we're drawing up right now is to cap the car carrying capacity of, the, of your street network on the edges, not in the middle, because that creates a bottleneck on the edges. And then you do that through cleverly um, numbering your lanes. Um, you do it through lanes, not, not actually the traffic count. You limit the number of lanes coming in. And then you create a consistent car carrying capacity throughout. So what we don't want is bottlenecks in your city, backups on the, the ramps, and backups at your intersections, and get a consistent car carrying capacity through your city. So you can get out of your driveways and slow the speeds down. So many good things happen with slower speeds, from gap acceptancy to crossing the street. And if someone does crash, which, which would be more unlikely, very little harm will come of it. And then complete streets. So everybody who travels can comfortably move around and just reward short trips, place, and the proper definition of mobility. And you will, you, you will see it year after year, your city will get better and better and better. And just like getting the sun in the center of the solar system, getting the human being in the center of your transportation solar system, everything will start to work out more sensibly. Your model will change back to the human scale again. And with that, I'll thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lockwood. And I guess we'll, we'll, we'll go through some commissioner questions right now, and then we'll have public comment um, shortly after that. Does anyone want to kick us off? Anyone? I will. Uh, commissioner, or Vice Chair Hughes, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lockwood. This was very, very informative, and I enjoyed participating in both of the charrettes. And um, I think that you've got a wonderful approach. The one question I have kind of is, we were um, the lone wolf out there fighting the 710 freeway for many, many years. And we were able to make progress when we really partnered and collaborated with our neighbors, Pasadena, Alhambra actually came to the table, San Marino, other cities, the San Gabriel Valley um, Organization of Governments. And we became the good neighbor and talked about the regional mm -hmm. issues and also the sustainability future that was important. So I just want to make sure that we don't take an approach, though, that would cause us to be the pariah again, where people are saying, wait a minute, you know, there's no freeway there, there's no tunnel there because you're part of the region and we need to move the traffic that was, and I know there's planning and development for the stub for Pasadena and what Alhambra is gonna do, but I think we have to also think about how does, have we been looking at also about how we fit as a good neighbor within our community and region and what we do so sure. that it's, it works within the region and it's not like you just come to this different mode, even though in some ways it's what we need to do, but how do we blend that and how do we take that in consideration? Great question. And it came up um, during the um, discovery week. And um, I think you need to be a good neighbor. And I think by following this paradigm shift, you'll be a better neighbor than you are now with your neighbors. 
um, delivering tons of traffic to Alhambra is not being a good neighbor. Or delivering tons of traffic to Old Pasadena is not a good neighbor. They need to do the same thing as we're suggesting. And every city in the LA region needs to become more independent. The trip making across the entire region needs to reward shorter trips, transit trips. These, these ideas should apply regionally. And if you continue to um, reward cut through traffic here, it, others will be expected to do the same and, and you won't progress. You, you will progress as a region if each city, if people can find what they need close at hand more often. It doesn't mean people aren't going to travel long distance. Some people have to do that and that, that's fine, but not everybody has to do that. And, and you don't have to be overwhelmed by cut through traffic in this city and everywhere else. This is a regional problem and continually rewarding long automobile trips, fast trips will perpetuate those problems. And so I would suggest you be a role model and, and encourage every other city to do the same thing because what you've been doing regionally has not worked for 75 years and with billions of dollars. And you could try for another 75 years and it'll get even worse. Or you can try a model that's actually worked in big regions previously. You know, believe what you see, not what the conventional models trying to continue to tell you, even though everything you see says it's not working. So I would suggest you'd be a much better neighbor to, to pioneer this in this region and, and encourage others to do so. Do you have the opportunity to talk to any of the cities, the mm -hmm. neighboring cities, so that you, there is a perspective there about kind of what they're, I th I where think they're going? Pasadena is more in line in terms of values as you guys. Yeah, they were supportive of stopping the 710 as well. Our firm, by the way, has been involved in the 710 fight for about 20 years now. Um, we've been analyzing their EISs every time they try another iteration of that highway. Uh, we've we, we were friends with Joanne Knuckles uh, 20 years ago. My mentor fought it five years before I even joined the firm. Like we've been involved with this thing for a long time and we're hoping to, um, to help design the stub. We, we co-led the Shret with uh, a mole polyzoides to fill in the stub. I don't know if you were part of it a few years ago. We connected the network and we showed a way of getting changing the interchange to be city friendly. And so we've been involved in this for a long time in Pasadena as well. And Everything that I was sharing with you tonight, we would like to apply there as well. And both cities would become more successful with shorter trips and um, softer environments and closer destinations um, if, if we were to follow that. Alhambra, on the other hand, um, they're not quite as far along, I think, in their values. They're still, they still think that they can reward longer trips on some streets in the effort to relieve others. I don't think it's going to work but it's their choice. Um, I think they'll figure it out eventually, maybe another 10 years, I don't know. Um, but I, I don't think they'll find a model that shows that what they're doing, um, some of the stuff is gonna work very well that they're doing down there, but other things, um, I don't think you can find a city that's ever succeeded doing what they're doing. And just like here with all the widenings and stuff, it, I can't think of a single city that has built their way out of congestion through those strategies. But I, I think they'll come along eventually. And we've met with them, um, but we do need um, leadership in this area. And I think South Pasadena can do it. And I think Pasadena will will be along very quickly. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any other commissioners with questions? Commissioner Abelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, terrific presentation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, it was like Transportation Planning 101. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, a couple of questions, and you, you answered it towards the end, sort of. Yeah, you know, I was taking notes along the way, and you talked about the need to change the culture and not accommodate the demands of those who uh, want to use our city as a cut through. Um, and the notes I kept writing were things like, well, where does the traffic go? Right. Um, we, when we talk about whether you call it choking or better managing traffic through on our arterials, the traffic doesn't disappear. It, what I, it, it, at least initially, that's what I thought um, when I started dealing with these issues 20 years ago plus. Um, one transportation engineer said something along the lines that uh, managing traffic is like rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic, you know, that no matter what you do, right, um, you're all going to sink. So 
um, well, what you're saying is a different approach, right? That there is a way for the traffic to disappear or reduce. And you had that slide, I think, with the eight different methods. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is, how long does that take? And what do we do in the meantime? And, and sort of connected with that, as you mentioned, limiting the lanes that come in, right? Because Orange Grove is a de facto freeway on-ramp and off-ramp between the Columbia, Columbia Street and the 110, right? And Fremont is a de facto connector between Pasadena and Alhambra. Um, those cars don't, aren't going to disappear, but, and certainly not overnight. So um, how do we deal with that? Because what we've noticed is when we try to manage traffic one, on one street or in one place, then it just finds another street to use. Sure. Um, so great question. Any more? Is that yes. okay? Yeah, so, but I'll stop. <laughs> so um, here's a question back. What happened to all that traffic in Copenhagen? There was thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of cars in all those streets. Where are they? Where did all the traffic go in Paris? Um, where did all the traffic go in West Palm Beach? Um, where did all the traffic go in San Francisco? 120,000 cars a day on the Embarcadero. Where is it? That place is more vibrant. So we're, we're, we're reducing, so reducing traffic, not trips. And that's the key. We're changing habits. Um, long distance trips by car create a lot of traffic. What we're suggesting is, is accommodating trips differently. And that's why I spent so long talking about the difference. Um, and so in Europe, they have, I can't remember the German term for it, but it's, um, it's called traffic evaporation. If you take the, like tra traffic calming is um, traffic tranquilization when you take the direct term, but we have to make it palatable here. Um, so traffic evaporation, which is a technical term now in transportation engineering, and it's a thing they do routinely, like we do what we do. And um, we call it trip re traffic reduction here. And that's about BMT reduction. And if you went to the Shret, you'll see a big thing of that equation with all those examples. And that's how we reduce traffic, not trips. And about how long it takes. So, so in West Palm Beach, um, we reduced the capacity of all those arterials and, and built all those buildings. It, it took about five years, maybe. Um, but it, it, we started designing the projects um, right away. And it takes a little bit of time for the projects to get built and so forth. Yeah, but it happens right away. Like when the Embarcadero fell down, Within two or three weeks, a lot of people had already adjusted. So it's it it happens quickly. Um, it it doesn't need to take forever. Um, in um, in let's Seattle, you you know you got um, Highway Five running along the the ridge, and um, or the, the mountain, and um, it had to have some emergency repairs um, at one point. They didn't have time to put on more transit. They didn't have time to prepare. They had, they had to fix this thing, whatever it was. I can't remember what it was. So it was shut for two weeks, and um, nothing happened. People adjusted, and and so there's all these examples, like when the um, highway in Atlanta caught fire. You remember that years ago? Um, if you looked on your phone, those apps that show you the red and the orange and whatnot, it was every day. It was all congested, but while that highway is being repaired. There was very little congestion in Atlanta. People just adjusted. Um, and people have been conditioned and sensitized to driving long distances. And, and they think, I, I have to do it. That's what I do every day. But folks will adjust. Cities will adjust. Um, all the cities that have done this have adjusted. The population has adjusted. And they're no different than the people here. Um, and it, it it is a different way of thinking about transportation. But it's a different way of just thinking about how people behave. And the reason we showed that universal equation is because that's what we need to do as professionals where, where planners are worried about things like reducing BMT per resident. So when they're planning a housing project, they put it where there's jobs and transit and so forth, which makes sense. If they're doing um, a shopping area, they don't put it out on the outskirts, which requires people to drive. They, they put it where the people are. So the land use planners can help reduce trip lengths. And then the traffic engineers can start slowing things down to make shorter trips more viable. They can start rewarding transit routes. They can start making walkable crossings and access to school. 
I, I, I don't know if I showed a cartoon, but I have a cartoon that shows there's too much b- traffic for Billy to walk to school. So we drive him. And, um, and so it's so hostile because there's so much traffic. We drive our children to school, which exacerbates the problem. So we just need to stop those um, behaviors and, and create an environment where those eight things where the traffic goes, that's what people do. That universal equation is what we do as professionals to position the city so that people can make rational choices in their self-interest that are part of the solution. They're, we're not going to force people to do anything. They will, they will um, on their own, figure this out, just like they did in Copenhagen and West Palm Beach and San Francisco. It will just make sense to them to start being part of the solution because we'll provide an environment that they can do it in. Like if we made Fremont to cross, easy to cross, people would cross it. Um, if we made Fair Oaks nice to, to walk along and shop along, people would do that. And the businesses would thrive. If we made it easy to walk to the school at the south end of the Fair Oaks, the kids would walk to school. Um, they, would, they would cross Huntington safely. Uh, right now, it's a six-lane thoroughfare, which we felt uncomfortable crossing when we visited it. I can't imagine a child crossing that. But it, it is feasible, and we can do it, and we can just change the design of it and make it happen. And then all these things will happen naturally, and rational people will make decisions that will result in a better city. So it, it'll happen right away. Every time you do a project, the city will get better. And that, that was the thing that struck me in West Palm Beach because I was scared to death. I was, a, I was young at the time and um, these were untested ideas and the county was down my throat all the time about how we're going to get Carmageddon. And I had a, a young one and I worked at the pleasure of the mayor. Like she could hire and fire anybody at management at will. And so I had to deliver. And what my predecessors did wasn't working and I needed my job. <laughs> like I... But everything else we tried wasn't working. And so I took a chance and, and put a road on a diet. Dan Burden came to town one day and called it a road diet. And I go, wow, that's a pretty cool word. Um, and it spread. And um, did it again. The city got better again right away. Um, kids started walking to school. I went back to that Olive Avenue. I showed you the before and after, a couple of years after. And I'm walking down the street taking that picture. And um, there's a guy out on his front yard planting flowers. And um, he didn't know who I was. And I thought I, all the fights I had to get this thing done. And um, I said, hey, um, I, I was here several years ago. And this was a big road. What happened? I said, I said this, is, this is crazy. What happened here? And he goes, oh, the city narrowed the road. Um, I go, huh, yeah, did it make a difference? And uh, he goes, oh my God. He says, yeah, my, my property value doubled. He says, I can sleep with my windows open at night and not be kept awake by the car noise. I, I know all the names of my neighbors. So I was talking to people on Fremont. They don't know the name of their neighbors. Um, my kids walk to school now. They, I would never have let them walk before. It, he says, it completely changed my life. I go, ah, oh, thanks. So every time I changed the street, stuff happened like that. And, um, and and then you get a critical mass. And then this, the city started attracting literally billions of dollars of investment. And people, people with choice came back to the city and repopulated it. And our, our reserves went from $7,000 to multiple millions of dollars. And we became a viable, financially successful, vibrant city. And it, and it had to do with the public realm. It would not have happened had we not changed the public realm. Okay. Because that happens right away. You don't have to wait 20 years. Okay. Terrific. Thank you. Yeah. Any other commissioner questions? Sure. Zavala. Hello. Um, good evening. Thank you so much for this presentation. Um, as a as a student, first first of all, just like as a student of applied linguistics, having you open your presentation with the the look at use of language in this um, field, I feel like it was you know kind of like I was back at you know back in college, kind of listening to a. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lecture and it was very eye-opening and um, I feel like it answered a lot of questions that I've been sort of wondering about since my time on this commission and I definitely feel like I have I have a question that's kind of unrelated but I mean I just wanted to make a little comment on this is that like you know I also I learned a little bit about um, the phrase look both ways before crossing the street I learned about where it came from I learned about who was the ones who pushed that phrase? And it came about due to, I believe, the 
rise of the of the car industry and everything like that and it it became like kind of a switch from instead of people walking across the street and um you know just naturally going across the street when when these cars came in into their towns and whatnot suddenly due to the education due to the funding and everything like that by the fossil fuel industries and stuff like that you know kids were being taught that they should be the ones to look both ways before mm -hmm. crossing the street that has like ever since learning about that i think that that has opened my un understanding that why should it be that a child should have to look both ways while crossing the street shouldn't it be the one who's driving they're human and so you it, it was really wonderful having you um cover a lot of these um very very um important questions and i think that like i i almost have no questions now um but i do have one specific one that is kind of like on the topic of like say you brought up like people who use applications and you see like the red bars and the orange bars and stuff like that so what exactly happens to like Google Maps or like Waze when like a city like this gets changed and it's like, you know, does Google still decide to create a cut through and affect the transit in the area? Right. So there's two companies, two private companies in the United States that do the mapping um, for all of the navigation systems, whether it's Google or TomTom, Tom, doesn't matter your car. And um there's inputs that go into that, that, and it's mostly based on travel time. Um, and as you slow things down, other routes will become more viable. Uh, folks will learn on their own that if, with their, if, if my if my pad is South Pasadena and they're starting at my pointer and going to here, um, they may go way around. The, the, their route choice doesn't begin when they get to the city; it starts far, far away. And I think it will help a lot um, when that happens. Some um, in a project we did in Texas, we changed the designation of one arterial and it's a state road. It's still a state road, state truck route actually. And it's still a state truck route. It goes right through their downtown. We changed the status of it. And overnight, 80% of the trucks started using a more appropriate route because we just changed the coding at those two companies. And so you can, as a, entity with standing you can have them change things if you want to um <laughs> the um <laughs> the bit about the look what's both ways and so forth there was a lot of um does that answer the question about the reading okay so um you know jaywalking you hear about distracted pedestrians now there's all these when there's a crash at night and some pedestrian gets killed or a cyclist they always say okay was the cyclist wearing a helmet that's always in the police report. Were they wearing high-vis clothing? Like, there's so much victim blaming going on. Um, every street in the United States and every city in the United States used to operate at four to eight miles an hour. Didn't matter if it was an arterial or a local street because that's how fast your horse walked. It didn't care what street it was on. And we sped up when the car came along. We thought, oh man, that, that can go fast. So we're, we're going to accommodate it. And we're going we're gonna to invent a designation and and say, because of the way we designate it, now we can go fast on that street. Um, and so we invented words like jaywalking to make pedestrians cross at the intersections where it's probably the most dangerous or the most conflict things. Um, and, and eventually monopolized the streets. Like it was on purpose that, we, that the profession did all of that because they were obsessed with motordom to, to make the car basically, basically the common denominator of of um, living in the city, thinking that they were helping actually because they thought people could get places faster. They never anticipated all these consequences. Um, so it was an untested model. And when it's now we have so much testing, it's pretty clear that it did have unintended consequences. But a lot of um, marketing and so on was created to, to keep that model going. And these, these ideas look ways, both ways and so forth was part of that. And in the Vision Zero thing, you've, you've probably started a Vision Zero policy at some point. Um, if you go to Sweden where that started, there's four pillars of it. And, and we've created a Vision Zero in the United States has become more or less a glorified safety program. But one of the pillars of Vision Zero in Sweden where it started 
was that the, the fault for the crash and the consequences of the crash are the responsibility of not just the people involved in the crash, but the jurisdiction who owns the street and the engineers who designed it. So we're all on the hook for the liability of those crashes. And I bet you if the engineer who designed Huntington was liable for that car that turned over and rolled into the yard or the one that crashed into the house, that they wouldn't have designed it with those high speeds. If they're, because, but now, because of the way things are set up, it's the user's fault. And they can say, hey, I followed guidelines. You know, it sounds like the Nazi thing. I just following orders, you know, I just follow the guidelines. But if they're responsible for it, you would see changes right away because they know it's not safe. It's, it reduces their liability, which is what they want. But the profession wants high speed, so they, they keep that um, protection. Um, but it's, it's not, I don't think it's ethical. You know, we all take an oath to the public welfare. So I don't think it's ethical. So that's why our firm, if you notice in the opening slide, that's one of our, the, the, the three pillars of our firm, one of them is ethics, because we don't believe that's, that's a good thing. And so in the, our projects, that's why we, we are so passionate about fixing it. So I don't think it's ethical what's going on. It's legal, but it doesn't mean it's ethical. Commissioner Fisher? Yeah, I don't really have a question, but I um, just want to make a, a few comments. I think in looking at this commission and its members and the prior commission that certainly having a balance among serving vehicles as well as pedestrians, as well as bicycles and transit has always been uppermost on our minds. I've, I haven't seen a case where we go in one direction or the other. It's, it's that balance you have to mm -hmm. have. Um, my second comment is that we, in the history that you were presenting and the ideology behind it, that often the word dangerous is used and speeding is used. And I think it's important to, when we have a project in mind, to make sure that we can back that up. That sure. if we have a dangerous intersection, we can say, hey, there's been 10 runoff road accidents or whatever there's been. Or um, there's speeding, we can say, you know, the speed limit is 35, but uh, too many people are going 45. R whatever it is, I hope we have data to back it up because I think often we, we need to go where the data takes us. Um, but, so many of your things were a joint effort of um, rezoning, replanning, urban development, um, that kind of joint effort. And the project we have here with uh, Fremont, Huntington, and Fair Oaks is not, doesn't include all those issues mm -hmm. where we can turn around a 75 year trend rather quickly. So I think we need to. Um, be aware of what this higher vision is, but be aware that, you know, basically from what I see, our, our role is to figure out how we can make uh, those streets, well, how, how can we objectively find problems, how we can make those streets safer, and how we can better serve the various modes that use them. That's our role. It, as far as trying to turn around the 75-year trend, you know, that will depend on others to rezone the properties, to have urban development, uh, all sorts of things that would have to be part of that to, to meet that objective. Yeah, I, I agree with everything you just said. Um, the planners would love to change things to this end. They, they're wired like that. Um, one of the hallmarks of modernism, which created this, um, situation where we're siloed, we're all working separately. They really valued experts. And historically, you had a town planner that kind of laid out the streets and the land uses and so forth. Um, some of the most famous plans like of downtown Washington, D.C., for example, was, was done by the same folks. The modernists put in place uh, people who did land use planning, people who did transportation planning, people who did parks, uh, people who did housing policy. They separated them all. And, and sometimes the, the engineers who's dealing with the streets never consider what's on the sides of them. Um, it's completely context insensitive. So 
I think the profession shifting already to be more inclusive and more collaborative. And you're right. Yeah, we we can't do it alone. And but I think it's some of the discussions that you know that we have with your staff. That I think it, that's known. And I think if if you could get together um, as department heads and so forth and say, hey, we're going to pull the same direction. See that equation. You land use folks, you start doing the land use parts. We'll start doing the transportation parts. Um, you get your housing group to do the housing parts and pull in the same direction. That's what we did in West Palm Beach in the 90s. The mayor got us together and said, okay, you're going to, I know you're on different departments, but you're going to work together or you're not going to be here. And she she ended up firing all the dead wood out of City Hall and replaced them with what she called her change agents to do that. So we didn't have to wait two years or three years. We could start right away. Um the balance thing. Um, I have a, another bit of a presentation on the difference between balance and priorities. And I would suggest that you recognize where your balance is now. And if you set your priorities correctly, you can change the balance. And then you have a different situation, change your, you know, adjust your priorities again. And, and, and progress is always made on the margins. You can't change 75 years, like you said, right away. But you can you can make progress every single year um, on the margins. Um, I would like to suggest there's a difference between speeding and speed. Speeding is when you exceed the speed limits against the law. Speed is when the speeds are too high, whether it's legal or not. Your speeds are too high. You also have speeding. So not only you have to reduce the illegal activity, but your speeds are too high and you want slower design speeds operating speeds, posted speeds. So there's, it's not just speeding, it, it's speed. And then about data and um, you want data-backed things. Everybody wants data every nowadays, uh, data-based solutions. Um, and I think when you, when you look at the bigger patterns, um, it's kind of clear what's going on. And when you make decisions, um, sometimes you don't have you know, five scientific papers that prove something, but the pattern is clear. And pattern recognition, especially in this day and age with global warming, the air quality issues, the sea level rise, all that stuff, we can't wait long enough until we have perfect data to make a decision. That's why we have professionals involved. That's why we use judgment. That's why there's humans making decisions and not an algorithm. And I think it's pretty clear about the patterns in the whole LA region and what's worked elsewhere. So I, th I think pattern recognition and, and sharing those patterns and stories will help you make more informed decisions instead of just always relying on the data. The data is really good, I would suggest, for more operational decisions, but for planning decisions, I think the patterns are gonna be most, most helpful. I'll, I have more, but I'll stop there. Great. Now I'll just wrap us up before we turn to um, public comment. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, I I agree with so much of your saying, of what you're saying, and you know I think if the way we were doing it was working, then we should continue. But I agree that it's not working. Um, we have double the fatality rate in the U.S. that we have our neighbors to the north and in Australia. Um, additionally, we have Climate change, um, you know, I, I spent $60 at ARCO that I would have rather have spent at the South Pasadena course on range balls um, the other day. Um, and I was in Copenhagen recently and uh -huh. I left a concert and I was able to bike from the show to my hotel, which was around six kilometers away in about um, 20, 25 minutes. And so I don't think you can get out of the Roseville parking lot or you know, the SoFi Stadium parking lot in 20 or 25 minutes. And that was pretty incredible to do that. Um, you know, also working in this field as an engineer, I understand that there's um, a lot of pushback. Um, you know, we have wonderful leaders in this community, wonderful elected leaders who were elected by the people. Um, we were lucky in South Pasadena that most everyone knows their council person's personal email address. They know where they live. I'm sure they run up to them at the grocery store. Mm -hmm. And um, we recently put up a, a temporary bike lane and some some delineators on the street just to test um, some potential 
slowing and and a small small nominal space for bicyclists and there was a large kind of pushback on that i guess knowing that we have some of those leaders listening like what like what is your message um i'm sure a lot of these policies were not popular among those leaders in a lot of these jurisdictions um for sure so i would suggest that this vision that we've painted is more of a compass we're not telling you exactly what to do you're going to have to make course corrections on the way but you're going the right direction and you're following that compass which is the, the, the that equation um you're going to come up to all kinds of obstacles and have to negotiate around them um in 1993, I was part of a symposium with a guy named Oli Durhaus. Oli Durhaus was the head of transportation for Denmark. And um, he this is the 90s. He was a young engineer in the 70s when they pioneered all this stuff. And, and it was so fascinating to spend meals with that guy. And um, we were together for a week or so. And he told me the stories about how it was then when they had no role models to follow like we have today. We had no, they had no language like we have today. So we have, it's easier today than it ever has been to do what we're talking about. It was really hard then when the whole world was going um, towards motordom and they, they were economically unable to keep it up. So they had to come up with a different model and, and who got together and how they started to talk and, 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 and to take this uncharted path and come back to traditional values. Um, and that gave me a lot of confidence that I could do it in West Palm Beach um because he had done it before but now we've done it in west palm beach we've done it in a number of cities around the states and it's never easy um and you've got lots of challenges but you have a direction you have a compass you have a vision and you have a supportive population uh, and there will be people questioning it when you go out and you do a temporary project today you're going to get pushed back because you don't have a compass you can show them you can say look we're going in this direction this is why we're doing it this is part of a big idea that will eventually add up to a really great city. And once they see the trajectory and that they're part of the solution, th there'll be more support for it. If it looks like a random thing that's just getting in their way on their drive, they won't support it. It has to be part of a coherent vision. And you don't need a roadmap. Um, that's, that's naive. There is no roadmap. You, every year you will advance further and you will make adjustments with your compass. But as long as you're going in the same direction, in the right direction, and you're pulling in the same direction, you will get there. Your path might be a little bit more circuitous or be straight. I don't know. Um, but you will definitely get there. Thank you, Mr. Lockwood. Um, Liana, let's let's go to public comment. Do you know how many speakers we have and how many people on Zoom? So right now we have one person um, here in the council chambers, uh, Casey Law. All right. Um, and how many on Zoom? I'm just trying to think about the time. Are there any participants on Zoom that would like to hand. speak? If so, please raise your hand. I have one. All right. We'll so we'll it. take the public comment here in the chamber first. We'll go, and then three, we'll go up to, to three minutes per speaker. Um, you may begin when ready, Mr. Law. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Casey Law. I'm a commissioner in South Pasadena. I'm actually over in the Natural Resources and Environmental Commission. Um, but today I'm speaking on behalf of myself and actually uh, an advocacy group called South Pass Active Streets. So we're a, lo a local group that has about 100 members and we're interested in thinking about improving the health and vitality and uh, sustainability of our city through changes and advocacy of how we use our streets. And that includes things like walkability and bikeability. <clears throat> Pardon me. So um, I just wanted to come here to say, um, you know, we've been participating in the charrette process and really excited about what, what we've been shown so far and we're uh, hundred percent enthusiastic supporters of the designs and this idea of you know changing changing the direction for what we've done in the past towards something that's uh, that's uh, maybe a little startling or different, but it's going to be I think a good direction for all of us. Um, uh, so I actually wore my shirt. Um, I used to live in I used to live in Amsterdam, so I have some experience. Um, the the lifestyle, as much as Copenhagen, is incredible because of. There are some CD elements that you may have heard of. That's not actually the lifestyle of most people in Amsterdam. It's really about you know getting around by bike, being able to see your neighbors, uh, enjoying your public spaces and and, and everyday life. Um, so um, I wanted to uh, uh, also mention um, you know I hear I see a lot of nodding of heads and a lot of support for the ideas and the goals of the uh, you know the feedback from the process and the 
designs that have been sort of floated so far. But I, I think it to sort of I hope it doesn't sour the mood a bit. I do think th there's a sort of context, a hidden context here, which is um, that the MTIC Commission has really has a high priority to spend a lot of this money on a project, which I think is really at adverse to the the goals of what we're talking about with uh, with this, these changes, and that's the you know this loop ramp project, which is about increasing throughput, uh, cut through traffic, higher capacity. You know, uh, maybe not necessarily wider roads, but it's a lot about capacity and, and speed. And I think that's um, something that we should be a little more honest about with everyone that's listening and, and participating in this process is that we have uh, excitement about the goals and ambitions of the of the redesign of, uh, say, Fair Oaks or Fremont. Um, but that's not going to happen at the same time that we're, we're improving, improving the throughput onto the freeway. And so I would like the I would like to hear some ideas or comments from the commission about how they see these goals going forward, especially in the context of limited budgets, right? We know that the Measure M and Measure R funds are, are gonna be limited um, and we can't do all of these things at once. And it's especially not uh, plausible if these things are actually intended to do opposite you know, uh, sorts of development. So um, I appreciate your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Law. Sean Meredith, it is your turn to speak. All right, Ms. Meredith. Hi, yeah. I'll just be really brief. Um, I'm just a, a resident and I went to the um, the workshops at the library a couple weeks ago. And uh, I went one day and I talked with one of the planners directly about, uh, you know, Fremont where, where I live just off of and just kind of, it's cause I have a lot of concern about the speeds of the cars and the safety of, uh, you know, the kids in our house and the kids I know all around who are trying to get from place to place safely. And it's scary. And so, uh, you know, then I went again to the presentation they gave on their ideas for Fremont and Fair Oaks and, um, you know, it and Huntington, it, I just found it extremely inspiring. Um, I can't even, you know, I, I, yeah, I, I came home and 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 tried to make myself like calm down a little bit because I thought that, geez, like how could a how could a city let something this good happen? <laughs> so, but it seems really, I, I you know, obviously there's there's complications, but I think that we are seeing around the world uh, cities that are making our local communities safer and uh, more local, and where we don't have to make every trip with a car. So I, I think this is really inspiring a situation. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Meredith. Anyone else, Liana? Is there anyone else on Zoom that would like to speak? If so, please raise your hand. There's no one else. All right. Well, thank you to everyone who gave public comment as well as everyone who's listening in. Um, I do want to check in with Ted and Director Gerber, I should say, and Mr. Pena. Um, I want to make sure that we're kind of give in our discussion, we're kind of giving you what you need or kind of what you, what we're expecting out of this agenda item We're you know, we're talking, I think largely a lot about, you know, a paradigm shift. And a lot of this is in the context of, um, the streets on the, on the agenda, um, without getting to, I know that we're not getting certainly in the weeds on these streets right now, but I, I want to make sure that you leave. Um, with the information that you're looking for from the commission. Thank you, Chair Dunlap. Um, so, you know, along the lines of, of your question, um, we're early in the process for the Fremont and Huntington projects. And um, as we discussed when we were talking about this item a couple months ago, we purposely included Fair Oaks in this evaluation because what we're really looking for is um, beginning of a longer term planning effort in addition to the initiation of the Fair Oaks Huntington project, um, and our hope is to move into the design and environmental phase after the planning work. Um, and so we didn't uh, pose this item as any sort of direct action or recommendation tonight. We really wanted to include the commission in the process because this is a you know an important step in terms of the other actions we'll take for this particular project and another you know, efforts that we talk about um, along the corridors in the city. So really just your feedback tonight about the process. Um, it's not something we have to you know, conclude discussing. Uh, we want to make sure that um, you're aware of the direction 
um, that we're taking with this consultant. And um, as we bring back the ideas from this process to have a good framework uh, for that discussion. So, so no action needed tonight, really just the beginning of this conversation for the, both the project and also some of the planning in these multiple corridors. Great, thank you, Director Gerber. Um, with that, I'll ask my fellow commissioners, Commissioner um, Fisher. Well, if, if the purpose was to get feedback on the Huntington, Fremont, Fair Oaks project, the presentation really discussed things at the higher level, trends in transportation and international and national projects. So my only comment would be that um, I visited the uh, the charrette that you were having uh, th this afternoon, and I talked with a few other people, but I didn't get an opportunity to talk with all of your staff. But I think it's important while you may have these big ideas about maybe how to rebuild Huntington, to put the frontage road here and the separator island here and the bike lane there and all that, which is fine. I, I think you need to continue pursuing that project, but just in case, it becomes too expensive or there's some problem that is realized later on in the process that you should come up with maybe some smaller scale plans that would achieve the same goal. Uh, for example, when I uh, met on uh, with one of your staff on one of the projects, um, Marengo and Huntington, I was shown that, you know, you're maybe planning a raised intersection or something and okay uh you can study that but you know we all know going into that effort that um raised intersections you know play havoc with the drainage and with the access ramps and maybe you can design your way around it but maybe the uh smaller alternative should be just to add a little bit more red curb to make sure that the bike lanes are continuous through the intersection and aren't suddenly abruptly cut off as they are today. I mean, there's a lot of little things we can do. There was some grandiose plan to, uh, at um, Huntington and um, Fair Oaks to allow traffic to reach the uh, grocery outlet in a more direct way, but it would have, you know, required a lot of construction and coordination with the uh, multi-story building. And, and that's at the foot of uh, um, Fair Oaks Avenue. And maybe, you know, just, just look at another way that might be less expensive in case that idea falls through, such as my idea was just sending the people and having them continue west on Huntington and making a U-turn on Maple and then coming back to the driveway. So I, I think you need to um, look at these um, ambitious plans, but I think we also ought to look at something uh, a little less ambitious just in case the other ones become too expensive or have problems that we may not foresee now. Thank you, Commissioner Fisher. Hey, any other commissioner? Commissioner Abelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I agree with Commissioner Fisher's uh, thoughts. And my, my question is more around timeline. So, because uh, tonight we heard a lot of macro concepts and ideas, and I guess later this week, um, Mr. Lockwood, your group will present ideas to the public and get some additional feedback, just reading the report. Uh, my question is, once that happens, then I guess there's gonna be a, a report for each corridor. Is that, that's what the report says here. Um, is that gonna come back to us to discuss the actual conceptual uh, ideas or what happens next and sort of generally, what's the timeline? Yes. So um, the results of uh, the consultant's work will be, you know, presented and discussed with the commission. Um, if we're following the traditional pathway of the project, uh, we would want to use that information to move on to the next step to move into design and environmental work. Um, and so, yeah, that is something that we want to discuss with the commission once we have that, those, that the conclusion, the, the deliverables from this work. And do you have a sense of when the time frame of so when it might come back? It's a combination of things because it's both the consultant's work, it's our throughput, it's our MTech work plan. We have, you know, we want to return to slow streets in November. 
So we, we may do that later this year or early next year. It sort of depends on a couple of different factors, but in the, in the short order, we're hoping um, within the next few meetings, we can come back and discuss that. Okay, great. And, and I do appreciate all the meetings that you're having with the public and with different stakeholders, including members of this commission. I think it's been a great process. Um, and I'm looking forward to being able to discuss the different concepts uh, in a few months. Thank you. I sure he's just one quick question. Um, Ted, one quick question. We know that we the funding that has been earmarked for this. Have we yet determined or would there be a plan or what is the thought or would there be a recommendation on how that gets allocated for the three streets? I mean, we're going to get the reports, but then it's like then we need to figure out like how much of this funding is. Because I'm assuming part of what will be um, part of the reports would be somewhat of an estimate of what these are going to roughly cost. So we have some idea of what we're looking at. Up we're, front. we're looking are at there guidelines between like, because ideally you could give us a report and say, gee, this looks fabulous, but it's a $24 million price tag. Well, that's, that's not feasible. So I'm, you know, there's that balance, which we talked about of funding versus design versus execution, you know, and uh, making things reality. So it's a good question. Um, there's additional work that has to be done in that respect. That's not necessarily going to be incorporated into this scope. For example, you know, we the consultants are familiar with our budget. We've talked about it, and really, what that comes down to is a prioritization of the work, and that's what we're gonna. That's what we'll see come out of this. Um, you know, looking at uh, utility realignments. Uh, you know, there's there's underground infrastructure that gets impacted. Um, there's cooperation with other cities. There's technology impacts when we're talking about intersections of traffic signals. There's a lot of other elements, um, but once we have this direction and a general conceptual idea, we can move on to those next steps. So the out of this effort, we're gonna try to prioritize what's the most important so that we can get into that estimating step. Um, and we, we have gone over those funding sources with the consultant. We have a, a little bit more also than just the Fremont Huntington because we've applied for this highway safety improvement money that's largely focused on Fremont and Huntington. So there's a couple different sources we can pull from and different, um, different uh, ideas will have different eligibility across the different sources. So there's, a, there's more work to do in that area and that'll be part of our conversation with the ongoing project um, past the scope with the commission, but certainly as a matter of prioritization, that's the work, that's that's part of our work now. I think the one thing to keep in mind is we need to make sure that the, that everyone is clear on the big pictures. So, you know, everything that's planned in the capital improvement plans, what's allocated because, we, you know, we've got the streets plan, we have the street maintenance plan, we have the slurry plan, we've got, you know, other things, the street improvements, which were the bids that are currently. So I, I just don't want us to, create something that becomes unrealistic and we get everyone excited with direction and yet we can't execute because the funding is inadequate you know it, so that we again look at the big picture of everything that we're doing so that the populace and and our electeds everyone knows what what we're envisioning and how we're paying for it and the timing of all of that that's a valid point. Um, so if you know anything about our staff's approach by now, it's that we're trying to look at that larger picture. And we have a 30-year plan for our water, sewer, and stormwater infrastructure. We're trying to reshape, um, possibly, and we'll be discussing this, uh, the city's approach to planning for street improvements in a different way than we've done in the past to make use of those efficiencies in, in more of an area type of approach. Um, this is no different considering where we have funding and which transportation projects fit into the long reach plans for the city. And so this effort is both uh, looking at that long range plan and sort of coming up with a strategic direction for these corridors, and then also biting off that initial chunk with this, this current project and where we can prioritize those funds. So yeah, we, we very much agree. Um, and one of the reasons we took this design shred approach was so that we could get some semblance of the community consensus early on in the process versus 
formulating a design and then delivering that for community acceptance. So it's it's a little bit different, but that's where we're we're generally going the direction that you're talking about. The concept of going because people, you know, still have the bad taste in the mouth about barracks and you know, that this is done. So Yeah, and so we're we're trying to take a you know take an approach. I don't know if it's different, but take an approach that considers that. Thank you. Of course. Thank you, Vice Chair Hughes. Um, Ted, a quick question about the, remind me, um, there's the $70 million, right, for the loop ramp um, or rough, um, that amount, if that, you know, should the city decide not to proceed with that project or it be determined feasible, um, would these, are these types of improvements, and I'm using improvements for everyone, um, are, are those eligible under that funding source? So, um, so the there's there's eighty million total for this oh, wow. measure R. Oh, we found ten more. Well, <laughs> so yeah, and I'll explain. There's eighty million for these measure um, R mobility improvement program projects. Basically, the money from the seven ten. Each city has an allocation. Pasadena is two hundred forty million. I don't recall Alhambra's, but it's hard higher than ours. Um. We've already taken 10 million of that and applied it to the Fremont Huntington project. So that's why it's 16 million. It's like $6 million, $6 million active okay. transportation grant and a $10 million um, MIP uh, funds. There are uh, eligibility requirements for that. And so in the initial, um, what we initially posed to Metro, and I mean, we as in the city some years back, um, was that would go towards um, some of the more, uh, for lack of a better term, um, the improvements that were focused on the vehicular portion of the projects. And when I say vehicular, I, I don't mean, I shouldn't use that term because I mean things like ITS infrastructure that could be used for both vehicle signalization and pedestrian cycling usage. Um, since that time, measure, Metro has passed a motion, this motion 35 that you can reform your usage of that um, and, and open up the eligibility a bit more with multiple constraints. So the long answer to your question is that possibly, but it would still require um, Metro approval depending on what we're proposing. Um, so that, that kind of goes back to Commissioner Vice Chair Hughes' um, comment on our strategic use of the funds where we want to use pedestrian funds versus, you know, some sort of um, improvement to the street infrastructure that might be more eligible for this type of funding. Um, so with that said, uh, our current approach, and this is because well, and we're basically following the capital improvement program and the plans that have been laid out before us. And we showed you this a couple months ago when we brought forth the environmental scope for the um, loop ramp project is to um, utilize a portion of that money for the environmental step. Uh, we still have some more work to do that to refine that and, and discuss it with the commission. We have a little bit of update on that tonight. Um, but at the moment, our plans with uh, Metro and Caltrans are to uh, utilize the 10 million for this project and 70 million for the loop ramp project. Um, if we wanted to change that, we'd have to reapproach uh, Metro and Caltrans about and then propose ideas. Pasadena recently did this. They initially had their money scoped for a grade separation project. They split it up into much a variety of other projects. Some went through and some did not. So it, it is possible to do. It's just, it's a process. I hope that helps. No, yeah. I, I think that answers my question 100%. Terrific. Um, yeah, um, I, I, again, thank you for this presentation. Um, I don't want to wait 30 years to be able to um, walk and, and ride a bike in South Pasadena. And, you know, I, I try to think we're only able, we're only able bodied temporarily, you know, and one day we'll need more time to cross the street or one day we might not be able, for those of us who are able to walk, we might not be able to walk one day. And so, um, I hope that we can, you know, create a safer city that really works for everyone. We have such a small city that, Unless you live on Raymond Hill or way up in the hill somewhere, there's no reason why you can't like ride to high school. But the reason is, I guess, is because we built it's not safe, 
right now and I hope we can get to a place where it's a lot safer and works for a lot more people. But um, thank you so much. And with that, um, um, we I do have a, okay. a, a question or comments or two. Um, so actually, I'm not too sure how much of this you could possibly like answer just with the perspectives of, say, the project with the consultant and also the project, say, with the hook ramp and stuff like that. Um, so I, I might be kind of bold to ask these questions, but um, no so. one, no one up here is bold. Just... <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess. Do you happen to to know? Like, I mean, like we we sort of saw it in in this presentation, but like, what could possibly be the return on investment on a project like the one that's being proposed with the consultant? Um, and like, how much money will this save in terms of like accident? reduction or property or damage to property um as for you know like just because you know the, the concern is is cost of course and that's a completely a very important concern obviously and so in my mind i'm looking at these two projects that one of them we're using a lot of money for and it seems to me that it's like we're going to be putting money into a project that won't be making us any money it'll actually be eating more money because we're going to have to maintain this hook rent like continually and it's not going to necessarily create more economic like motion and it seems to me like the project that is being proposed by the consultant is something that will actually have that return on investment not just for you know the like property values and everything else like that but it, it just seems to me like it's a no-brainer and um and so, I mean, like, and it seems like that's been proven by what we've been seeing through the consultant's work. So, like, like once again, it's just like, it's just like, why would we spend the money on a project that won't make any money? That's, that's how. It, it's an interesting question. I don't think we'll, we'll, you know, even if we had it in our um, plan to build some sort of social economic value on you know this project or any combination of projects i don't think it's something that is feasible for us to do um i think that we'll all have to make our own sort of judgments on uh the, those values that our consultant talked about tonight and which direction um we want to pursue but um the good thing about this is that uh this is not like a a, a one day thing or a one week thing or a one month thing um our project delivery processes in the city are iterative and a step by step. And so um, we can present these ideas uh, just like we did tonight. And then as we come back to the next step, we can present um, and make sure that we're heading the right direction. And, you know, I think the value will speak for itself and we won't have to, you know, we won't have to try to evaluate it with any sort of economic modeling in that way. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate Should, that. Commissioner sure. I have a question, but it's late. So I'm going to just ask it this way. When staff comes back to us with the design, the concepts from the consultant, will the consultant be here again as well or not? We're not planning for the consultant to attend the next session. Okay. Um, you know. Uh, then I can ask my question. Yeah, now. sure. Of course. There's an expense associated with it and we're just trying to keep. No, no, no. Like that. Yeah. Absolutely. So question for Mr. Lockwood, if you can answer it in a minute or so, great. If not. We can talk offline. It's a conceptual question. Is reducing congestion and bottlenecks, the, that concept, is that inconsistent with having slower, safer streets? Are they mutually exclusive or not necessarily? And am I making sense? Um, what you want is a consistent car carrying capacity. If you remove a bottleneck and just relocate it, you're going to be chasing congestion forever. So I think I think you have to be careful how you reduce it. One way is you add more road or capacity somehow. Other the other way, which we're preferring, is to reduce the amount of traffic. And um, well, I'm thinking. Sorry to interrupt you. It's just to Mr. Law's comment a few minutes ago. I the, the wheel started turning. So I was just wondering: is that necessarily true? That if we that if we move forward with a loop ramp that's going to improve the um, the operation of an intersection, right. is that does that necessarily mean that we can't have slower, safer speeds on that corridor? 
uh, I'm not trying to get no. The short answer is no. It's not. They're not completely related. The if you make it though easier to to use Fair Oaks and the and the interchange, it will attract more traffic. That's what he. That's what he said. And because you have an insatiable supply of more traffic, you'll probably get back to where you're at now, just in, involving more traffic. Um, so you need to be careful. In your past, when you've added car carrying capacity, it's filled up as well. Not surprisingly, um, in Dallas, they, sorry, in Houston, they added what is it, ten lanes or eight lanes or something like that to I-10, thinking that you know Texas scale widening was going to solve the congestion for 20 years and it filled up right away and. One of the most embarrassing cases of latent demand in the whole country. <laughs> so that's probably what will happen here. Um, I would, um, so I'd be careful about adding car kind capacity and hoping for a different outcome that's happened in the past. Um, if I could but just add something to that just really quickly. One of the issues, though, is also the safety issue, uh -huh. flow, and the logistics of how that is figured. And then where there's a limitation there because you're talking with a historical freeway. So there's limitations on that. But if there's a way also, because we've got the way it's figured, there's safety issues too, besides sure. the bottleneck. So again, you know, taking into consideration the safety concerns and how the the flow might be, but also might help with where the pedestrians cross and where the the cross traffic and that is accident prone. So you might be able to help us as we look at that because there is those considerations as well. Sure. Yeah, we have a group looking at that at the Shret right now. And I think, well, I shouldn't speak too soon, but I think we have a better idea than Loop Ram. But, um, we're still drawing it right now. That addresses those things you just talked about. Commissioner Fisher? Yeah, I, I've heard the Loop Ram mentioned more than one time, so I feel I have to respond to this. Uh, the loop ramp will reduce the number of signal phases at the intersection such that that intersection will operate similar to that at Mission. I think um, Mr. Lockwood indicated that if you have the same uh, ability at each intersection to move, then you've you have a better consistent design along the street. So the, the effort is not to speed up traffic or to add traffic for the loop on ramp. It is simply uh, to make it, to have a similar ability um, to handle all modes of traffic at the intersection as you have at the other intersections. Also, I think it needs to be said that um, reducing congestion and eliminating bottlenecks, as long as you don't relocate the bottleneck, um, is desirable from an environmental standpoint. You, um, you increase greenhouse gases when you sit in traffic, sit in traffic not moving. And I can't tell you how many times all of us have sat uh, at, uh, on Fair Oaks at Mission not being able to move because there's backup for three intersections because of the bottleneck. But, you know, you, you don't want to have greenhouse gases and you don't want to have it to burn excess fuel. So it, they do, it does have an environmental standpoint. So I think as long as there's a thoughtful design to make sure that you have this intersection operating uh, in, in a consistent way with the other intersections upstream and downstream, there's definitely a benefit to that. Um, may I actually just... Yeah, real quick, we need to probably okay. move on. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Commissioner yeah. Zavala. I'll try to make it quick. I know I'm in rare form today. Um, I will say just um, just a quick sort of off the top of my head from from talking about this this loop ramp. I think for me the biggest issue that I see is the fact that it is a historical um, bridge over this historic freeway, and we can't widen the bridge to accommodate pedestrians. And it's like you know we look at all of the models, I'm sorry, all of the designs that we that have been presented so far. And it seems like it's very difficult to add a safe means of travel over that bridge. I mean, even as it stands today, it's not very safe to travel for pedestrians or bikers. Um, it, it really only seems to serve the cars. And I think that that's not balanced. And I feel like 
if we add this hook ramp, it adds another layer of difficulty for somebody who's trying to travel as a pedestrian across that bridge. Namely, because if we can't widen it, then it's not going to, you know, like it's, it's kind of, it just doesn't really make sense to me. I, I guess that's all I'm saying. Thank you, Commissioner Zavala. Commissioner Abelson? Oh, no. Okay. No? All right. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you again, Mr. Lockwood, for your presentation. What are the hours on Thursday that, that people can stop by? I think th uh, Thursday, we're, um, today was the open studio where people could stop by. Uh, Thursday will be our um, presentation at 645. Sorry, 6 p.m. to 7.45. Okay, yeah, so thank that's, you. Not, that's not like a come and go. You'll want to be there at, at 6.45? At 6, at 6 p.m., sorry, 6 I misspoke. 6 p.m., yeah, um, at the at the South Pasadena Community Room at the library. All right. Well, Can, there's no meetings on, on that day because we have a lot to draw. Just a quick question for yeah. staff or request for staff. Would you please make sure that the city sends something out about this so the community knows that would... Because yeah, well, what we can do. do is we have a, a website up with our information, but we'll we'll um, we can send out another um, like That's a little social media blast. Yeah, yeah that, that would be that. great. Of course. Okay. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you all. Um, with that, we'll go to agenda item four: project status updates. Um, as everyone knows, we created this item um, just so we wouldn't have to ask questions. We can read them before or after the meeting. Um, but I will turn it over to Ted. Um, if there are a couple of items that you want to highlight. We will do exactly a couple items. We will do two updates. Um, uh, the first is our uh, street improvements um, project. So uh, since our last meeting, we had um, we had posted the first bid package for the street improvements project and actually uh, closed the bid uh, yesterday. So we received um, eight responses. Um, I should uh, I should uh, clarify that on this item it says the budget from the general fund is two hundred ninety eight thousand. That's actually one million two hundred ninety eight thousand. There's a typo. There's a one that should be in front of the two, and that's why the I, I think we found our money for that. <laughs> sure, that's why the total is three point eight. So that that is correct. Um, and so uh, right now we're evaluating the the bid packages, uh, preparing the documents. Our plan is to bring that. For a contract award to council on November first, uh, and thereafter uh, begin the work on the streets. The contract would be given um, the notice to proceed in early November uh, if our plan goes um, as expected. I will turn over the second update to to David. Sorry, David. No. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry to catch you off guard. No, no, no. no uh, update on the uh, the loop ramp. Project. Yeah, so um, last week we actually met with um, our consultant HCNB and as well as Caltrans and uh, Metro just to have an initial discussion with them. Um, you know, we had mentioned to the commission that we were going to set up a meeting uh, with these different agencies to discuss uh, uh, a brief overview of the project and just give a provide an update to them because they had they hadn't heard from us. I think it was about a a year or two since we had some you know initial movement, but um, Ted had been communicating with Metro on uh, some of the statuses um, that had been going on um, in the last two years. Uh, just some of the things that were discussed during the meeting was just like some of the project object objectives. Um, they reviewed some of the initial Caltrans comments that they provided for the initial loop ramp design that was presented um, by HCMB. Um, they also discussed some of the technical studies that they're going to be uh, looking at or considering. Um, if we move forward with this EIR process, uh, some of the design considerations and the limitations as well. Um, we discussed some of the uh, the future meetings that we're going to have. How is that going to be um, um, put together in future meetings with Caltrans, Metro, and um, HTMB? And separately, we also are going to have another separate meeting with Metro to discuss the uh, the funding to. Uh, make a determination whether that funding source that we have for the 70 million will be able to cover uh, this initial process of the EIR. Um, so that's something that we're going to set up with Metro in the next um, coming coming days or coming weeks. Great, thank you. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to any commissioners who have questions. Projects. Commissioner, that's your his. 
<laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be really quick. Um, I know we don't have a lot of time and it's late. The only two I had was, um, I'll do, is on the Columbia Street, the um, striping improvements that we've earmarked. I know, you know Pasadena kind of was back and they weren't doing it and they're doing it. We have a timing on that because it's such a critical pinch point and it impacts also Orange Grove and some of the other areas that we have concerns about if that could be, um, we know the timing of that. The last other one was also the timing for our warrant study for the Garfield signal. Uh, sure, so on the, the first item, the Columbia Street striping, uh, we're mostly relying on Pasadena. They'll be taking the bulk of the work on this project. They're currently working on their um, funding agreement. Uh, so I think they have timed the project to not start this fiscal year, but perhaps uh, next fiscal year. And that would be the... Um, so July 1, 2024, and then yeah, but after that? In, in starting, that would be like the design work and you know environmental work. Um, so it wouldn't necessarily mean like construction would occur in 2024, 25, but that's when they've, when they, that's when they'll begin spending on the project. Um, we have talked to them about the Orange Grove issue. Uh, just, I think we met last week, I'm trying to start to keep track of the time here. Um, and so in addition to discussing possible improvements um, at the Orange Grove and Columbia intersection, um, and we learned a little bit about their traffic signal system and what's about the about the flashing red issue. Yeah. Um, so they uh, we don't currently have the capability to um, to uh, reconfigure that intersection in in such a way as I think there was an example about Del Mar that was brought up. Um, and that's why that signals on flashing red, because it doesn't have the detection that's on flashing red or all red. No, it's. I think it's an all red. It's an all red. Yeah. yeah okay. Right. And so. And you need Q to probably limit. Yeah, we don't have the exactly. Yeah. So we talked about adding that as part of the um the Columbia Orange Grove project. In the meantime, um, we haven't really fleshed this out uh, too much, but Pasadena is very much willing to assist us with any temporary measures that we might want to do along Orange Grove in terms of marking your signage. But yeah, that's just an early conversation. We don't have any ideas uh, posed on that just yet. Um, as far as the Garfield uh, Monterey warrant, we haven't started um, the process yet, um, but we do have um, an on-call in mind. And uh, we have a handful of other priorities we're trying to accomplish uh, first. But um, we're hoping that we can get that initial initiated by before the end of the year, before the end of the calendar year. Thanks. Of course. Great. Commissioner Hamilton? Commissioner Fisher? Commissioner Zaw? All right. I, I have a, a quick question about the, I guess I was reading through the the farmer's market contract with the, with the chamber and there was a parking study or something, a parking management plan on Glendon Way. Is that new? Or, or is it an existing one and is this being updated? So um, the, uh, no, we have an existing plan um, that's been approved that the farmer's market utilizes. Um, the recent we've, we had committed uh, during the, when the city um, basically renegotiated its agreement with the Chamber of Commerce, in the agreement we had committed to working with the chamber to um revisit the traffic control plan um we took a very preliminary step in the last couple of weeks by meeting out there with um the chamber of commerce folks um and uh some of the a, a couple of the residents along glendon way because that's really where the impact seems to be felt about the situation um we you know we we didn't learn um we learned a couple things but mostly it's what we already understand it to be you know there's the blending ways uh fairly narrow um the trees impact the structure of the street there's parking on both sides um and it's pretty full um and then there's the uh there's a you know a commercial 
parking lot area on the north um, east side. And um, obviously the Metro line runs right through there too. So uh, we don't really have a whole lot of ideas to, to alter the plan. We talked about some signage. Um, so really that's just a, a work in progress. Okay. So yeah, there's, Thanks. there's probably not too much more to it than you're thinking. Yeah. I saw that. I was yeah. A little curious. About sure. That. But with that, thanks for this update. I do have one public comment. We have one public comment. Yes. All right. So. Tucker Nelson. Thank you, Liana. You're welcome. And, and Tucker, you may begin when ready. Up to three minutes. Okay. This concerns the Fair Oaks uh, SR110 interchange. Uh, I oppose to having the Luke's, excuse me, I oppose to having the loop slash hook ramp in the title and as a means of referring to it. It makes everyone think that is the only possible design. The consultants today who are here today also worked on this interchange. Are both the other consultants, uh, projects, processes going to work on it? Are both of them going to work on it or just one method? Uh, I much prefer the design input process for the three quarters that was presented earlier today to the opaque process that has so far happened with the Fair Oaks SR110 interchange. The summary in the agenda mentioned public's feedback regarding the scope of work. I don't remember that happening. The summary also implies that work is proceeding, proceeding on the one design without consideration of any other designs. I feel there needs to be more open public input on this process. Thank you, Ms. Nelson, and always appreciate you attending our meetings and your public comment. Thank you. All right, with that, we will go to our next agenda item. What's that? Agenda item two, um, approval of minutes of the Mobility and Transportation Commission on September 19th, 2023. Um, if you check the packet online, it was not the latest um, version. Um, Commissioner Vice Chair Hughes and I, we worked um, together to try to put the minutes as close as possible to the new format being requested by the city, which is, um, as I understand it, to be a, a more stripped down action oriented um, type version. So if anyone has any edits they'd like made, feel free to raise your hand or just jump in. Commissioner Abelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So one of the changes I had for the prior version, you fixed in the new version. So I, um, I appreciate that. Um, just so it's just a couple of quick fixes. One, just the top of your, uh, or the, the, the current version, the transportation is um, misspelled. Just, just a transportation, I mean, a transposition Great. of the S. <laughs> uh, very, very small. Um, page one, two, three. Communication section five, third paragraph that start at starts at the last council meeting. The discussion, the discussion was regarding a proposal just be should be four upgrades um, instead of four, and then uh, under six, section six, second paragraph. Um, Commissioner Abelson co commented that there have been two recent vehicle accidents. Just add or excuse me on Orange Grove Avenue with one at Oliver and at Prospect. So just add on Orange Grove Avenue, Orange Grove Avenue after, after accidents. And that is it. Thank you very much. All right. So correct the spelling of transportation upgrades for the golf course. Or propose a proposal for a oh, proposal. Yeah. Proposal for upgrades. Yeah. And then on Orange vehicle Grove accidents Avenue. on Orange Grove Avenue. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Chairs, just um, where we have, there's a couple places for consistency either way, AV, AV, or AVP period because you've got it mixed. Right. Whatever. Oh, okay. Formatting. Mm. I always go two letters just to save space, but we can we can go three letters. I'll I'll trust Liana. We'll make those consistent with either two or three. I, I was brought up that uh, when it's within a sentence, you spell it out. When you put it on a sign or something, then you can abbreviate. So oh, okay. I think I think it needs to be spelled out. Okay. If we're I'll stay out of this one. 
<laughs> I'm I, I love some white space on my document, so I'm gonna go with that. With that, do we have a motion? I would say move approval. As as amended. As a amended. second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? All right. Minutes approved. Five zero. We will move on into communications. We have um, commissioner or council member. Sorry about that. Jack Donovan with us. Um, do you have any updates? Uh, yeah, I'll bring you up to date on what's going on with the council. Uh, it seems like a lot of things are coming to fruition now as we get to the latter part of the year. And projects have been working on all year are now coming up. And uh, uh, briefly, Saturday, the entire council, along with the uh, department directors, uh, all departments, uh, met at the Scout House at Garfield Park and spent the entire day, probably seven plus hours, for strategic planning. And a lot came out of it. Uh, you know, direction we want the city going. And uh, it was a long Saturday, but I think we made made some progress. And also at the council meeting coming up tomorrow, one of the things that be on the agenda we've been leading up to, and it's going to be the uh, just cause eviction ordinance. We've been working on uh, that for the last few months, and we'll have probably a draft copy to present at the council meeting tomorrow. Um, and we'll go from there on that. The other big ticket item will be on the council meeting tomorrow is the Athens contract. And uh, that's something we've been working on for a couple of years. And we do have to complete that this year. I think we've got, I think that we have a mandate from the state to complete that uh, by the end of the year, which we plan on doing. And let's see what else. Uh, anyway, it's been busy since the last time I've been here. And also, I, I think there'll be some comment on, well, it depends on whether I put it together after talking to a few of you tomorrow. Uh, what happened here tonight? I think what happened here tonight was uh, eye-opening. Okay. Leave it at that. Great. Okay. And uh, other than that, that's uh, all I have to say. Thank you, Council Member Donovan. Um, Commissioner Communications, anyone? Vice Chair Hughes? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just really want to thank Ted and David and our consultants when who left, but really appreciate all the hard work and effort going into um, this development for the city as we look at these three important streets. And much, much thanks to all the hard work and effort you guys are putting into it. Thank you. Commissioner Avelson. I echo Vice Chair Hughes's comments. I'll be brief due to the late hour. Commissioner Zavala. Um, I also agree with Commissioner Hughes's comments as well. I think that um, we all have a, a really deep concern in this town for the, you know, the ways that we, you know, develop our city and move forward and make these decisions. And um, I, I really appreciate everyone's passion. Thanks. Commissioner Fisher. All right. All right. My only thing, I saw a sidewalk being repaired the other day, and I could not believe my eyes. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. It was like, holy smokes. <laughs> like, look, at, look at that. Um, so, yeah, I appreciate everyone's hard work. Um, I was very excited to just see some something move forward. Um, we appreciate your hard work. Um, do you have any anything, Steph? Leona, you don't have to put holy smokes in a minute. <laughs> Yeah. Just two quick um, reminders. So we have, as we mentioned earlier, we have our um, our presentation meeting with the community with the um, our uh, Fremont Heinz and Faros consultant this Thursday at the South Pasadena Library at 6 p.m. Um, we also have the Arroyo Fest. We won't meet again before that happens on um, Sunday, October 29th. We'll be closing off uh, Mission Street and part of Orange Grove and, of course, the 110. Um, I think that starts at 7 a.m. is when festivities start. Uh, and then into the afternoon, uh, we'll preserve Mission, um, the Mission closure, but the uh, 110 and Orange Grove will be reopened. Thank you so much. Great. I do have one. Um, dumpster Day is on Saturday um, at 
um, on a Royal just south of Mission. Uh huh. It would be from 8 a.m. until 2 p.m. Okay. What does someone bring to dumpster day? Anything that you cannot um, throw in your regular trash. Okay. So refrigerator, couch, things like that. Larger items that you cannot. So throw what in I'm hearing trash. is don't just throw it. No. Um. Correct. And no electronics. Okay. Um. And no hazardous waste. Cool. And do you need to bring proof of residency or? I would have it just to be on the safe side. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liana. And with that, it is 923 and I'll call um, this meeting adjourned. Thank you. Yeah.